Okay, there we go. All right. Let's get it. Everybody can see the screen? Is it screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. All yes. right, then. What you see? Yes. Is it Dr. Khaled Muhammad? What, what is it that you see? Yeah, we can see yeah. All right, so many of, us say, many of us say that we come from Africa, which is fine. Flat Earthers say that we come from the North Pole. Um, some say that we was already here just in America alone, as if we didn't travel the whole globe. Um, this is the problem, and I agree with Dr. Khaled Muhammad because he says Africa is not our home. Uh, Africa is our throne, and from our throne, we ruled our home, which is 196,940,000 square miles of the planet Earth. You just want to claim a spot or the whole thing. Well, I'm under the impression, as Dr. Khaled was and is, that we ruled the whole planet. Right, because there was no one else on planet Earth before 6,000 years ago except for us. <laughs> the so-called Orientals came by way of the Cone people, who is known as the San people, or the Kohisan people, or Kohisan people. This is where they came from. You can see the info eyelids on the Cone people. You can see the same thing on the Nubians from out of the Sudan and Ethiopian region. This, these info islands are the beginning of the people known as the Orientals, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Taiwanese, from Taiwan, the Vietnamese, the Philippines, etc., etc. Okinawans <coughs> for Okinawa. All right? Just want to make everybody understand that. So we want to go into what are haplogroups. A haplogroup is a group of enlilies in an organism that are inherited together from a single parent. And a haplogroup, a haploid from the Greek, hapless, one fold, simple, English group in a group of similar haplogroups that share a common ancestor with a single nucleotide polymorphism <coughs> mutation. More specifically, a haplogroup is a combination of acrylides at different chromosomal regions that are closely linked and tend to be inherited together. As a haplogroup consists of singular or similar um, haplotypes. It is usually possible to predict a haplogroup from haplotypes. Haplogroups pertain to a single lineage of descent. As such, membership of a haplogroup by any individual relies on a relatively small portion of the genetic material possessed by that individual. Each haplogroup originated from and remains part of a preceding single haplogroup or para group, and as such are related, any related groups of haplogroups may be precisely modeled as a nested hi hierarchy in which each state or set haplogroup is also a subset of a single broader set as opposed that is to biparental models such as human family trees. Haplogroups are normally identified by a initial letter of the alphabet. A refinement consists of additional numbers and letters combinations, such as, for example, A to A1 to A1A. In human genetics, the haplogroups may commonly studied are Y chromosome, which is Y DNA haplogroups, and mitochondrial DNA or MET DNA haplogroups each of which can be used to define genetic population. Y DNA is passed solely along the patrilineal line from father to son, while mitochondrial DNA 
of Met DNA is passed down through metrilineal line from mother to offspring of both sexes. So yes, the father is able to produce both sexes patrilineally. He can produce that matrilineal line and that patrilineal line in the mother, but it's the mother through her mitochondrial DNA that passes this gene of this information down to both sexes, which is male and female. Neither recombines and thus Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA changes or change only by chance mutations. It's not by chance. The environment, the sun cause um, these micro um, genetic mutations. The sun caused this, the environment caused this, the cosmic um, energies cause this. If we talk about primarily the solar fatic energy that's in the environment that comes through the north and south pole, that comes down through the various atmospheres from the Van Allen belt, the um, ionosphere, the magnetosphere, to the mesosphere, down to um, the stratosphere, down into the toplosphere, which is the closest sphere to us. And you have what's called the biosphere. Technically, that is the closest from the toplosphere. And these genetic mutations at each generation with no intermission between parents' genetic material. Like in a new Bantu, Semitic Hebrew, Israelite, slash you and I. So here we have the origin and evolution of um, primordial man by Albert Churchward, and he says here, from here, these little men spread it all over the world, north, east, south, and west. Now that means the news. North, east, west, and south actually is news, N-E-W-S. So we spread it the news. We spread it all over the world, north, east, west, and south, the news, until not only Africa, but Europe, Asia, North and South America and Oceania was populated by them. So, number one, the oldest people on the planet Earth are the Pygmy or Twa people, and they spread it already into Europe, Asia, North and South America and Oceania was populated by them. So that means that the first people in North America, the first people in South America were the Twa people. Now, how did the Twa people look? He was the first, the little red man of the Earth. The little red man of the earth, well, yeah, Adam was called um, um, Adam, or Adama, which means red, or blood, which, which symbolizes that reddish color. So these are the little red man. So remember, the Native Americans was called the red man. Well, hold up, these little red man was already in America, in North and South America, before there was anyone on planet earth. It was just them. And from the pygmies, Evolution continued progressively in the following order. Next came the Bushmen, which now they are saying that the Bushmen are the oldest. Technically, no. But this is what is claimed, and that's all right. That's fine. From the Bushmen, who is known as the Khoisan, who is known as the Sand people or the Sandalwe people, who is also known as the Kong people. It's the word Kung Fu. They was already in the Orient, as you see here. We was already in Asia. This is where Kung Fu comes from. It's from the Kung people. The first civilization of Asia in China specifically was the San or Shango or Shang. Xi'an, Shang. The word Shang is short for Shango from out of Nigeria. So these were the Ni first Nigerians, the first pygmy slash Nigerians that went into Asia. And we now have what is known as the martial arts. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. You have the Masaba Negro. You have the Niolic Negro. You have the Maasai tribe Negroes. And you have the Mongoloids. And then the so-called Aryanists who are the so-called Europeans, the Albions. They was the last. And it was no evolution. There was a de-evolution. And I'll show you why. So here, get the books. Gods and Spacemen in the Ancient West by W. Raymond Drake. 
Gods and Spacemen in the Ancient West? Such an unusual title. And then it says that the Pygmies inhabited the Earth for 30 million years. But we know where they went over those 30 million years. They were in Europe, Asia, North, South America, and Oceania, which means what? The Pacific Islands. That means all the way from, um, from um, Australia all the way to Hawaii. That's Oceania. The Oceania. Oceania. Uh, Oceania. All right? That's the Oceania, which are the Pacific Islands. Right or wrong. So they was there. Right, we have no we have another proof of that. All right. The opinions in terms of various ethnic groups worldwide where average height is unusually low. Anthropologists define pigments as any group of males, adult males that grows to less than 150 centimeters or 4 feet 11 inches on average height. In other words, they're shorter than 5 inches. Now, the members of the lightly taller group is termed pygmioid. All right. The best known pygmies are the Aka, the Ifa, the Mbuti of Central Africa. They are also pygmies in Australia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and Brazil. The terms are included in the Negrito of Southeast Asia. The remains of at least 25 miniature humans were lived between 1,000 and 3,000 years ago were also found on the islands of Palu in Micronesia. All right. So, show you once again that these so-called pygmies spread it throughout the world. Once again, they brought the news north East, West, and South. We brought the news to the whole world. Each letter symbolizes the four corners of the world, as they would say. North, one. East, two. South, three. West, four. They brought the news. All right? So this is what we're seeing. Now, here we find a 28 million year old human skeleton at the British Museum in the basement from the Caribbean islands of Guadalupe. So we know that if they exhibit or inhibited the earth for 30 million years, and then just 2 million years later, we find the remains of them in Guadalupe in 1812 of a Caribbean woman of Guadalupe. And she stood 5 foot 2 inches tall. So that means that she was a pygmyoid. Members of a slightly taller group is termed pygmyoid. Right, so she wasn't a pygmy. She was a pygmyoid. She stood five feet, two inches. She was taller than five feet. And Guadalupe woman is complete in every aspect except for her feet and head are missing. And it's an authentic discovery. And it was in the British Museum for over half a century. When the two-ton limestone block contained the Guadalupe woman was first put on exhibit in the British Museum in 1812. It was first is it, um, displayed as a proof of the Genesis flood. In 1881, however, the exhibit was quietly taken down to the basement and remains to this day. And it's there. How we know is because my wife and I went in 2008 to the British Museum. And the curator, one of the curators, he wasn't a head curator, but he was one of the curators. The head curator was not there that day, but he told us specifically that 80% of what you see of, of what's not seen here is in the basement. Only 20% what you can see is here on this floor. In the basement, 80% more. And he verified to us that there, that this skeleton was there in the basement. Now people heard me tell this story over and over again. So here we go back again. Guadalupe woman. Guadalupe woman, 28 million years old human skeleton. How is a human skeleton found? And this is what they said. It was a perfectly normal skeleton of a moderate type who discovered in the layers of the limestone 1.6 kilometers long on the northeastern coast of the island of Guadalupe. 28 million years. So this is verified. And guess what? Because of this fact, we find that the Guadalupe woman, who was a pygmyoid, from, descended from the pygmies who've been on Earth for 30 million years, that both of them are older than the gam eight species.
So how the fuck do we come from the apes? The apes species 12 to 16 million years old, produces the orangutan, 6.8 million years ago, producing the gorilla, 4.6 million years ago, producing the so-called humans. As you see here, they got the cone people, but that's not true. Wait, they got the, the bon, um, bonobo, and they got the chimpanzee. So how the hell if we have a perfectly human in 28 million years ago, perfectly human skeleton, 28 million years ago from the pygmies from 30 million years ago, and I'm being considerate with these estimates to know that it's older than the ape species which they claim that we came from the branch in which that broke off 4.6 million years ago. How? We was already here. Here is Dagnesh, who is known as Lucy, who is only date back to 3.2 million years ago. So here we have another branch in which that is said to be less than 4 to 6 million years old or ago, in which that allegedly this eight species we descended from. This is what they say that Lucy was one of our ancestors. Really? Let me explain to you what happened. We humanized the monkey species and this is why you have monkeys who have tails and then you have the apes who have no tails because we was humanizing them. In other words, we was fucking with their DNA. And this is how they came about not vice versa. We did not come from them. We put our DNA in monkeys to produce the eight species. So this is why when they talk about that these are peop these uh, species are closer to us than any ancestors, we have to say, yeah, we humanize them. But even then with the humanization, mm -mm. let me show you what happened. What does God chosen people actually mean? Let's look at that. Well, here's Dr. Edward W. Robinson. The discussion, the talk is about the world's DNA strand and why the government don't want you to learn them in school. So, he says they tested the orangutan and they found out that the orangutan only had three DNA series. Three. Uh-oh. Here it is. Only had three DNA series. And it goes back to 12.16 million years ago. So, we continue humanizing them, and then you see, it says when tested, the gorilla, they found that the gorilla had four DNA series. Oh, there you go. Then the gorilla comes in 6.8 million years ago. You see, everything I'm telling you is the truth. They tested the chimpanzee, which is an ape, an ape and found as well as the bono, bonobo, a bonobo, and found that he had only five DNA series. <coughs> Here you go. So Bonobo and you have the chimpanzee. There they are. Only 4.6 million years ago. So we kept humanizing the monkey species. It transformed them from monkeys into apes because we gave them more of human DNA. And I'm talking about humans. I'm talking about um, actually the Syrian and Anunnakian bloodline. It says Right here, they went into all the different races of the world. They went into Europe. They tested the DNA series of the English from French, the German, the Spanish, the Russians, and they found that they only had six DNA series because they tested 116 different human groups. And all of them all over the world had six DNA series. They went over into Japan and China, and they only had six DNA series. Then they went to Africa, to the African people, and they have nine DNA series. Nine. So how in the hell did we come from the orangutan, which only had three DNA series, if we had nine? How in the hell did we come from the gorilla, if they only have four, and we have nine? How the hell did the chimpanzee, how did we see come from the chimpanzee, who allegedly is 90, uh, 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 9%, 98 to 99% of the same genetics as humans? What humans? Not us. Not the African people who have nine DNA series. The closest ones to the chimpanzee, which has five 
DNA series or those who have six DNA series? Who is who? The Europeans, the Albions, English, French, German, Spanish, Russians, as well as also the test of 116 other different human groups, as well as also Japanese and the Chinese. They all only have six. So they have the closest to the chimpanzee. So yes, they are the monkey's uncle. But that's not us. We have nine DNA series. So we're three higher than everyone else. We're four higher than chimpanzees. We're five higher than damn gorillas. And we're six higher than the goddamn orangutan. Where do we see this DNA series take place at? Well, Dr. York tried to explain it. He spoke about the fact of the nine, six ether and the nine ether here. And what he says, he says, the follicles of the woolly or nine ether hair is flat and grows out to form a curl, a tight curl. The hair is the key. It's simple and clear. As in the case of a baby, babies are born with straight or curly hair, and as they mature, their genes get stronger and their hair thickens. Nine ether. They call it 4C within the so-called hair community. So, from below the Sub-Sahara, as you see here, all these red pyramids and these pink diamonds or squares and yellow squares show these people with six DNA series, while those with the green circles, which is below the Sub-Sahara, show us, as we are also descendant of these Sub-Saharans, Africans, allegedly, the so-called African Americans have the same, we have what's called non-Ether. And so therefore, we have the same as that of the Sub-Saharan Africans, and they have nine Ether. And what is the science behind this is that this is the reason why we are God's chosen people. So so-called Hebrew Israelites are Hebrew Israelites because they are from the Bantu people. And we have a nine DNA series, which is the highest potential. The highest potential, y'all. The highest possibilities of genius. All right? The highest possibilities of genius. All from the Bantu expansion. So we have nine DNA series. Once again, it means that we have the highest possibility of genius. This is why all the inventions was made by us. The toilet bowl that you use on a daily basis was made by us. The refrigerator that you go in that you put your food, frozen food, as well as also your regular food was formed by us. John, John Standard formed that. He made that invention. I'm sure he was E1B1A. But that's what the Israelites saw. The Bantu people was E1B1A. The Khoisan people are E1B1A. The Nigerians are E1B1A, particularly through the Yoruba and the Igbo people. The Ghana, the, um, those from Ghana, the Ghanaian or the uh, people are E1B1A. The Senegalese, E1B1A. They have the highest amount of E1B1A. Guess what? 50% to 75%, half to three-fourths of us here in so-called America have E1B1A. So this is the highest possibility of genius. So wonder why they want to keep you oppressed, suppressed, and depressed. Because you have the highest possibility of genius. It's in your genes. Genius, you get it? Your DNA. Your nine DNA series. Your nine ether. Your nine ether. So remember, you know, um, you know, they said, uh, uh, matter of fact, we turned the whole ether joint. Um, now I turned the whole ether joint on Jay-Z. So now when you say, yo, 
If somebody won a rap battle, we say, yo, you got ether, nigga. <laughs> and we need an ether, everyone on the planet Earth, that ain't with us. <laughs> And how you do that? Number one, through knowledge. Number two, building what you need to build for yourself. Reducing your gardens. Reducing your civilization. Reducing your towns, your cities. Building mounds, pyramids once again. Why? Because you have the highest possibility of genius. I know many of us just want to sit around and use the Albion's platform, his YouTube, his TikTok. You want to continue using his instead of creating, remember, hell, um, M.U. Wally. Philip M.U. Wally is the one who designed the internet, a brother from out of Nigeria. Or from out of Africa. Philip M. Uwali. You think he's a billionaire? <laughs> or was his genius stolen? By Bill Gates of Microsoft, who just stepped down last year, year before last, from being president. To, to invest all his money into land, fake-ass food, called GMO food, because he's one of the biggest partners and sit on the board of Monsanto. But the UN say there's no conspiracy theories. Bullshit. What they want to de what they want to do is destroy the guide gene. The guide gene is the nine DNA series, the highest possibility of genius, which connects to the right hemisphere of the brain, which happens to be in the same area of the brain in which that is called um, the particular um, area um, of the brain, which they put probes on, and which that shows um, access of what is called out of body experiences. Same information, same area in the brain. They don't want you to know this. So the sparrow helix here of black people is in tune with the laws of the universe. The power that causes the hair to black people to sparrow is the same power that causes atoms, planets, galaxies, and the double helix sparrow of DNA and the universe to sparrow and rotate. So the human race, six ether versus nine ether. You have the ether groups, which means burning gas. You have six ether, which is carbon-based, European descent, can't absorb energy from the sun. Majority of them can't. At 10 to 13 years old, they lose the function of their thymus gland, which is um, the heartbeat of the immune system. They are moon or lunar people. Lunatics is where we get the terminology from. Then you have seven ether and eighth ether. Then you have nine ether, which is carbon, high African descent, can absorb energy from the sun, don't lose their thymus gland, all right? And it is your sun or solar people called the children of the sun. The sun equals greater light, which is nine to the ninth number nine, which is 81. And you have children of the sun, which is lesser light, which is nine to the second power, which is 18. Um, 18 turned backwards is 81, and vice versa. So, we know that eight like dog hair, six ether. And this is no disrespect, it's just showing, remember, that the chimpanzee have five DNA strands. The Albion has um, six. So they are the closest. So this eight like a dog hair, that's the closest on um, straight hair of goats, six ether. All right? Then you have the same hair, which that you can see on the woolly head sheep, nine ether. We have that. All 
right? Got to show you this information because this is information that can save your life because it shows you that not only do you have the highest potential for genius, you also have the highest potential to transform into a vehicle of light. <laughs> Everybody else and everything have to struggle to do that. For example, those who have six ether here, such as the um, Chinese and Japanese, particularly, like, let's say, those who are in Tibet, in which they are able to transform finally, it takes them 13 to 60 years to transform their body into light. It can take you two years. Because you have three more DNA strands or three DNA series of strands of DNA, however you want to say it, than they do. So your evolution to Godhood is quickened. But you have to obey the rules. And what is the rule? The rule number one, to be able to transform, you must think positive thoughts all the time, at least for two years. If you're talking about from two to seven years, you can transform. It takes them 13 to 60 years to transform. You, two to seven years to transform. If you focus your attention on that, if that is your highest goal, and guess what? You develop what is called the returnable body, the rainbow returnable body, meaning that you can return and and um, personify or materialize as you once was as a human and dematerialize that body back to light at will. And you can do that on different dimensions. This is what the whole science is now of the parallel Earth, Earth 1, Earth 2, Earth 3, and which that you see on Flash and on Supergirl and on um, Batgirl and on um, 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 Lightning, Black Lightning, and all these DC um, comic book, you know, TV series as well as also on Marvel, of the multiverse. The parallel Earth and the multiverse, all of that shit is the same thing. And you as a light body can transform into it and travel back and forth on any of these particular planets. What you got to do is use your GPS. And what is your GPS? Your pineal gland. Your pineal gland is the GPS. Look it up. Your pineal gland has the ability to have you within a physical body as well as also have you talking and communicating with the spiritual ancestors. It is the meeting point between the physical and the spiritual, your pineal gland. In particular, your soul embedded inside of the pineal gland is the connecting piece between both realms, the physical and the spiritual. So here, according to Zechariah's central interpretation, and knew was assumed to be the name of the Supreme God. In the epistle, mythology, or monological um, meaning of and knew is the Lord, leader, and king. As a personification of heaven, sky, his kingdom was the expanse of the heavens. Just like the Greek god, Uranus, which is Uranus, Na is um, either a verb or an adverb, meaning to sin. In many Akkadian, Sumerian, Assyrian, and Old Babylonian texts and inscriptions, Na was written as Ena and meant in, from within, so on. Ki meaning earth in Akkadian and Sumerian, but also means the underworld, the neither world, the world of death, 
maybe they regarded earth sometimes as the world of death because everything in the earthly material world eventually perish. So who are these Anu people? Well, if you just read Zachariah Ascension's information, you say, well, the Anu people were the Syrians. Actually, it wasn't even a people. It was just Anu who was the father of Enki and Enlil. Wrong. This is the Anu people who was known as the Twa people who lived in the Nile Valley to Mali. They are the Dogon, all right, called Telen. They lived in Portugal, Germany, England, called the Pits and the Laps. They lived in Scandinavia, where they was called the Finn, as in Finland, named after them. The Twa lived in Ungorland, Canada, called uh, Sacralins. North America, called the Mound Builders. They lived in the tip of South America, where they was called the uh, Fingians. Now, these are the same places that we see was told to us by Albert Churchward in Origin and Evolution of Primordial or Primitive Man. He says it. He says it, that these are the men who was what? The 12 people, the pygmies, spread it all over the world. And so when I did my video, all over the world. And I did that and I kept going on saying that that's what I was talking about, that we was all over the world. And so this information verifies that perfectly. People have to get to the information. They have to understand what's going on. So it's here. It's important to note that in addition to Twa, who is the pygmies, who is also a new people, some of the names for our people included Naga, Naga and Negas, which loosely means serpent, people or people of the serpent. The name is also synonymous with Pharaoh and kings. So you raise the symbol of royalty, power, wisdom, and protection. Chasing the serpents out of Ireland is a metaphor for genocide. All right, so the Anu people. So who were the Anu people? The Anu people were the first and original people of this epoch of human history as the original type one homo sapiens. Their time of dominance extended from around 200,000 years ago to around 25,000 years ago. Now, of course, these albions are being very selective about their timeline because this is dealing with academia. But we know that it's much further than that, um, than that because we just went over it. After the time, another form of man called Homo sapiens sapiens type 2 became principally dominant. Here, the, in terms of statue, the Anu were a short or diminutive people, standing about 4'3 on average. Typically, they had rounded faces, very little bodies, hair, and their skin was of a brownish melodic hue. Later populations of Anu built the beginnings of major cities and complex societies. Their world comprised civilizations we have yet to fully comprehend. For example, for instance, their later prodigy produced the earliest foundation of societies like pre-dynastic Kemet, Egypt, Sumer, which is Samaria, Elam, Right, which is the Hebrew Israelites or Hebrews and Chaldea, which Abraham was from the land of Chaldea, according to the Bible of Mesopotamia. Angkor Wat, which means the 50 um, cities or 50 um, statues in which that verifies the 50 cities as in the 50 states of North America. And it says that the Messiah would be here within the Americas. This was found in Angkor Wat. Go and watch um, Brother Edwards um, as he breaks that information down. Um, on Anchor Watch. The Seminole Shane Dynasty, as in the term Shane Go, which means they came from out of Nigeria. All right? They, they worship Shane Go, the Shane people. That means that would be the Yoruba people in the Far East Asia, as well as societies throughout the Americas, Oceania, and the Pacific Islands. Towards the end of their reign, and new people developed 
um, metal smelting, and then it was some 30,000 years ago. Around this time, they also created the concept of fishing using nets, evolved agriculture so that men did not have to wander. Listen to this, originated various styles of art. <coughs> Martial arts is one of them, crafts, architecture, and the sciences, which they a few the mathematic, the um, thermatic, and the intellectual world of what we know as modern empires. <coughs> Okay, right here, go further. Furthermore, it is the author's belief that these small people were also the first to reveal divine wisdom to humanity, wisdom that had been conveyed through the ages via myths and legends. Then as translations and interpretations, these revealed bits of wisdom ultimately became what we call known as our Bibles, Qurans, Gita, Veda, Torahs, and many other sacred books of scripture. Although this conclusion may differ from what you have been taught or to believe, it is still very much in line with the physical evidence that is being unearthed on a regular basis. And based on what we are currently learning about the Anu people, it's not far-fetched to believe that they were the first people to utter their seminal words, words that link all humanity to the foundation of creation. So who are the Anu people? They are the Pygmies, the Twa people, or the Anu people. So when you talk about Anu and Suma, which is Mesopotamia, and we just showed you that they came or they were in Mesopotamia, this is who we are talking about here, once again, he tell you that it was in Mesopotamia. All right? He tells you this. <clears throat> and Twa comes from the word Pata. Twa, Pata. All right? Let's look at that again. He tells you right here, for instance, their late prodigy produced the earliest foundation of societies like pre-dynastic Egypt, Kemet, Tameria, Tamare, Suma, and Elam and Chaldea of Mesopotamia. So the first Sumerians, the first Egyptians were the Twa people called the best people, B-E-S. Okay? Simple. Hit the book, Return of the Ancient Ones, written by Empress Vidyasi Tierra, Washington, Turn a Good Guest on El Bay, my cousin. <clears throat> this is what she says about it in the book. And new equals the nigger in its original form, and it stands for divine Negroes or those who came down to earth from heaven. This star Sirius system is connected to the planet X, which is Nubiru or Nebiru, which is coming towards Earth. It's already here. It's symbolic action to your pineal gland. The awakening of the soul. The inner meaning. Then you have the external meaning, which is actually a craft, or as they call it, a planet, in which that is here. Now, actually, it's, the, it's a sun. It's called Sirius C, which is called Emiya. That is um, the star from Sirius system is Sirius C. Emiya. Here, some Anu move northeast of Baba Tiba, or Shilak, Nur, Sudan, and the Anu Ak. All right, now you will find out who's the Anu Ak. The Anu Ak or the Anunnaki people. Remember, I showed you earlier that the twelve was called what? Naga. Here it is. It's important to note that in addition to Twa, some of the words or names, excuse me, for our people included Naga. So the Anunnaga is the Anunnaki. You get it? See, this is how we got to put this information together. There's been a problem with our people putting this information together because they've just been following white authors. They don't know 
African studies. They don't know Native American studies. They have no clue because they've just been studying European studies, history. Sorry, I can't do that. My foundation is African studies. So you have to put all this information together to tie it up. In 9,600 BCE, the Bongo, Congo, Ifa, Aka, and Atwa, the Anu peoples, the Anu peoples, lived in the forest and at the foot of Baba Tiba, which is Mountains of the Moon, Mount Ruwanzori, east of Lake Kivu, Rwanda. The Anu say that in the beginning there were Ilamu, a Ilama, all right, Alama, or Alima, Alim, supreme being, Tahu, which is actually the 19th attribute of Allah, which is Alim, of Allah. So Ilima, or Alam, or Eli, which is also Ali, which means the Most High God. Tahu, sacred tree, and Tahuti, moon god, on Baba Tiba, mountain of the moon. The Anu gathered fruit, nuts, and plants. Who are the Anu? Once again, they are the Bongo, Congo, Ifa, Aka, and Twa. These are the small people that we just showed you. These are the Anu people. The word Anu simply means those who came from heaven to earth. All right, or Anu means on high, as in the Enuma Elich. Some Anu moved northeast of Baba Tiba, as we just finished talking about, which is the mountain of the moon. Sherlock, Nur, Sudan, and the Anu Ark. The Anu Ark or the Anu Nak, or the Anu Naki. And I will prove it to you. Of Taseti and Tanesi, right, which is where? Ilu Babo, Ethiopia. Ori in the Anu, or Ori Anu. Ori Anu, Ori is Osiris. I'll show you that too. It's listed in the Ethiopian records as the first Nagai or Nagis in 4530 BCE which would be over 6,500 years ago. 6,552 6, years ago. The first calendar date of the um, Cyril, first known calendar, started 4,241 B.C. with the helical rising of the Sirius star. The first alphabet appeared around 4,100 B.C. The Anu people lived in the highlands, studied the stars, the moon, and the sun. Same as the Dogon. And the Dogon say that they came from the star constellation Sirius. Same place as the Anu people, as you see here from the Emperor's Return of the Ancient Ones. Moreover, until the drying of the lakes, the Anu people developed a system of water navigation between interconnected lakes and rivers. In fact, they drudged the Nile, as the Anu people are the Osirian or the Osirian people, the first to enter into Egypt. They were the first to drudge the Nile. They would explain the emergence of a well-organized civilization possessing knowledge of the celestial bodies capable of navigation on the lakes, rivers, sea, oceans of the earth. Needed to know the circumference of the planet, the length of the year, the name, the main length of the earth orbiting around the sun. We know that is on 25,000 um, miles, which is equivalent to 25,920 years cycle of the equinox, all right? The acceleration of gravity and the speed of light in order to build who, which is Sphinx, and the pyramid um, complex of um, Jessa, which is Giza, right? Who did that? The Anu people, right here. The Egyptians, the colonies, sent out by the Ethiopians. Osiris have been the leader of the colony. Osiris gathered together a great army with the um, intentions of visiting all of the inhabited lands and teaching the races of men how to cultivate. Or his, um, suppose that if he had made men to give up their savagery and adopt a gentle manner of life, he would receive immortal honors. They were the earliest and said that the proof of this is clear. Or clear that they did not receive an immigrant 
but are the natives of the country and therefore rightly are called Anchitanis, right? Or Anchitanis is also universally accepted. Those that those who live in the South are likely to be the first engendered by the earth is obvious to all. They further write that it was among them that people were first taught to honor the gods and offer sacrifices and arrange processions and festivals and perform other things but which people honor divine. For this reason, their pious piety is famous among all men and the sacrifice among the Ethiopians are believed to be particularly pleasing to the divinity. This is Diodorus, the first century BCE. Diodorus was a historian. As we now have it from A.D. Um, Emily, um, Emily, um, Emily Lanou, um, from 1850 to 1916, and she writes, these and new Ethiopians were agricultural people raising cattle on a large scale along the Nile, shutting themselves up in walled cities for defense purposes. To these people, we can attribute without fear and error that most ancient Egyptian books, the Book of the Dead, which is the book of Kumbh for by day and night, and the pyramid text or the text of the pyramids, consequently all the myths and religious teachings, I will add almost all the philosophical systems then known and still called Egyptian. They equally or evidently, excuse me, um, knew the craft all right, necessary for any civilization and was familiar with the tools that trade it required. They know how to use metal. They made the um, earliest the temple of writing. First, um, the whole Egyptian tradition attributed their art to Thoth or Tahuti or Jehuti, the great Hermes. All right, and the word Jehuti is where we get the word Jew, as in Judea. All right. Matter of fact, um, the pronunciation of um, Yahuda is the way that it's pronounced within Hebrew, which is the same as Yahuti within the Egyptian. Showing the um, um, phonetic um, um, and the etymological um, connections between those two words. And it says, in Anu, like Osiris. So it says, in Anu, like Osiris, who is called Onian, chapter 15 of the Book of the Dead, coming up by day and night, as it is called, actually. So Book of the Dead is a misnomer by E.A. Wallace Budge. And in the pyramid text, certainly, the people already knew the principal arts. There's left proof of this in architecture of the Temple of Abydos, the Temple of Abydos, especially the Temple of Osar, or Osiris, in which that the sepulchres objects have been found bearing the unmistakable stamp of their origin, such as in carved, what, carved ivory. All these cities, Anit, Anu, Menta, Anuti, or Anuit, Sini, today called Enash, or Ene, Ermit, and Kosh and Heliopolis, which means city of the sun, um, have the characteristic symbols which serve to denote the name Anu. So, once again, who is Anu? Anu is a ruler, an Anu ruler of Egypt. All right? You need this from Petri, the making of Egypt, 1939. Right in uh, Wayne Chandler's of Gods and Men, Egypt, Old Kingdom, he writes this. In this chapter, I hope to demonstrate that the origin of civilization of Egypt, Kim, was Black African, specifically Ethiopian or Anu. The history of Black will remain suspended in air. It cannot be written correctly until African historians get corrected in the history of Egypt. Well, we're already doing it now. And I'm using his information to do so. In reviewing Egypt's beginnings, we find an advanced civilization already intact from the earliest dynasty. Um, this fact has perplexed historians down through the ages. Common sense detect, 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 dictates excuse me, that if Egypt began fully matured, then its civilization may have originated elsewhere. Herodotus says the father of history, Greek father of history, that is, was told that the first man to rule Egypt was men. All right, that is Osiris. That is the same Osiris that we just seen, who lived so long ago that Egypt was still underwater. So this is why they had to drudge the Nile. Right, in men's times, the whole country, except the 
district around Thebes was a marsh. None of the land below Lake Morris was then showing above water to this place for the sea. Now we is seven days passage up the river. All right, so here got the Anu once again people. Besides this type belonging to north and east, there is an Aboriginal race of Anu or Anu. It says people written on the three with the three pillars who became a part of the historic inhabitants. The um, subject ramifies too doubtfully if we include any single pillar name. But looking from the Anu uh, writing with the three pillars, we find that they occupy southern Egypt and Nubia. And the name is also applied to what? In, Sudan, in um, Sinai, as in Mount Sinai, biblically, and Libya. As the southern Egyptians, we have the most essential document, a portrait of a chief, Taranetor, roughly modeled in relief in green glazed um, valise, found in the early temples of Abydos. Receiving his name, his address is given on the earliest or visiting cards. Palace of the Anu in Hermit City, Taranetor. Hermit was the name of the god of Tip Tipperion, 13 miles south of Luxor. Um, Ermet. Opposite it is was the place of Anu of the south, which is Anumenti. The next place is the south is Anuit or Anti, all right, um, which is called Gibberlin. And beyond the um, Anuit Sine, which is um, um, Isna. So today, as ascendants of Anu, not descendants, ascendants, We've become the Anurut people, uh, or the Anuit, or what is known as the Anunnaki people. Proof? Look at the Bantu people, ethnic group. Right here, we find that, according to um, Credo Moutois, he says that um, uh, a Bantu simply means the children or people of Antu. Now, who is Antu? Antu was the wife of Anu. It says, in this event, Africans came to be known as Bantu, meaning Antu's people. Cultural historians attest, actually attest to this fact that the ancient Africans revealed a goddess more than they did a god. In okay, mythology, Antu, or Antu, right, Akkadian, is a Babylonian goddess. She was the first consort of Anu, in other words, the wife of Anu. And the pair were the parents of who? The Anunnaki. So we are the Anunnakians of Anu and Bantu or Abantu, which is Antu. And the Utik and the Utuki. It says right here, Antu was a later development of Ki as early earlier Sumerian earth god or goddess. She was also conflated with Kichar. The link to the Sumerian civilization in Southern Africa simply cannot be ignored or erased. They can even be traced with etymology in the names and origin of indigenous people. The most obvious evidence of the mysterious origin of the word Abantu, the name commonly used to describe black Southern Africans, according to Credo Matois, the name is derived from the Sumerian goddess Antu. In other words, Abantu simply means the children of people of Antu. So we have these people who are the children of Antu, and then we have these people who are the children of Anu. And these two produce what is called the Anunnaki people. You get it? Okay, you don't believe me? Let's continue on. Here's the ancient population, according to MyTrueAncestry.com. This is my information here. And you put in Biaka Pygmy. Who do you see first on the list of the Biaka Pygmy? You see Bantu, southeastern. Then you see Luya. Then you see Bantu, northeastern. Then you see Bantu, southwest. Or you see Mbuti Pygmy. You see the Mandinka. You see the Yoruba. You see the San people. All right? So here you see 
Oh my Bantu, this is Sarel Email Bay. This is my, um my kit um information from my true ancestry and you see from fifteen hundred well fifteen um hundred and fifty or one thousand five hundred and fifty BC from the Bantu people all the way to fourteen hundred A D of the Bantu people. Right? This is all connections. And guess what? All these connections showing from then fifteen um, from um, fifteen to fifty um B C they had E one B one A. So all of these people of band two had predominantly E one B one A all the way down to fourteen hundred A D in Kenya, who was the band two people that had E one B one A. You see also in 950 AD you have um the Moors of Cordoba Khalifa. The Moors also had E one B one A. All right, and I get to that in a second. So the Moors are also an extension of the Bantu expansion. Who are the Antu and the Anu people? So Zachariah's Ascension observation interpretation of Anunnaki means the name Anunnaki is generally believed to mean something to the effect of those from royal blood. So the E1B1A is royal blood. He also suggested that the Anunnaki can be interpreted as Anunnagi. Remember who is the Naga? Who we told you? Huh? Let's look at it. Well, see, this is why we have to put all this information together. Right here, for instance, there, uh, uh, matter of fact, here we go. It's important to note that in addition to Twa, some of the names for our people included Naga. Niger, which is the word nigger, and niger, niggas, which loosely means serpent people or people of the serpent, which means it says this name is also synonymous with pharaohs and kings. So this is why we are of the royal blood, as he says here. The name Anunnaki is generally believed to mean something to the effect of those from the royal blood. They also suggest that name Anunnaki can also be interpreted as Anunnagi, Anaga, Anunnaga. All right? Don't believe me? Let's let's continue on right here. It comes down. Moderate, um, many moderate um, scholars disagree with him and his interpretation, but cannot explain the work on the widespread similarities in um, ritual practice throughout the world. The um, Oxford Companion of the World Mythology described the Anunnaki as is described as the Sumerian deities of the old primordial line. So you are from the old primordial line of the Anunnaki's of the Sumerians. And this is already shown because I showed you that the Twa people who are the Pygmies, who are the Nagas, who are the Anu people were in Sumer of Mesopotamia. You show that already. All right? Do I have to show that again? Maybe I do. Because we always have people who don't put this information together and this is what we want them to do put it together here it is for instance their um later prodigies produced the earliest foundations of society like the pre-dynastic kemet egypt Sumer, there it is samaria um elam and chaldea aware of mesopotamia all right so let's continue on we got to show it we got to prove it so right here um it says um they are uh Kirtonic deities of fertility associated eventually with the underworld, which they became chief um, judges. They took their names from the old sky god An or Anu. This interpretation has some implications in relation to the Indian um, Quranic geology and mythology of Naga worship. The word Anu comes from the line of the first Manu and brother of Puru, while Naga snake worship was common in ancient um, India and several Hindu deities from Jaina, um, um, Turkvankara, uh, Buddha, Shiva, and Hindu Krishna has been associated with the snakes or snake as guardian. Right? And the, um, the Antatnag is a place of Kashmir going back 5,000 years in Kashmir history near the abode of blue gold, um, God, the blue God Shiva, 
with serpents around his neck. Kashmir, Kashmir Valley is filled with water streams and lakes where Naga used to reside as per um, Rosh Tara um, 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 Nani. An ancient chronicle of Kashmir and their stories go back to the first king of Kashmir, which is um, Gonanda I, who um, fought alongside Kuru in the um, Maradaba, or the Maradabata, um, Rata um, war. So, Anunnaki, it says, those are royal blood. Anunnaki, history, the exact origin of the Sumerians are unknown, is it? It just showed you, showed you that the proof of, of that was the Anu people. They entered Mesopotamia around 4000 BC. Well, if they don't know, I'll tell you. Here are the people of the Anuak. Remember, we showed you Anuak. All right? Right here, we go to Anu, Anuak right here. Some Anu moved northeast of Baba Tiba, um, Shilak. Nur, which is Ethiopia, and the Anuak of Taseti and Tanesi, which is um, Elububa, which is Ethiopia. The Anuak. So who are the Anuak people? They are the Anunnaki people. The Anuak of South Sudan. This is how they look. Do they look any different than the children here? In the so-called United States, don't look any different to me. But these are the Anunnakians. All right, how we know? Let's go to our alternative name. It says Anguak, Anguak, Anuak, Anunnaki. All right, the Anunnaki or Anuak people is known as the Anua or the Anua or the Lao. Nihilic ethnic group inhabiting parts of East Africa. The Anua belong to a larger Lao family group. Their language is referred to as Daha Anua. It is primary form found in Gambala, a region in western Ethiopia, South Sudan. And guess what they're doing? They are genociding these people off the planet. Because these are the real Anunnakians. The Anuak people of Ethiopia and Sudan live in a subsistence um, economy and have a strong dependency on their rivers. They grow their crops among the riverbanks, which in turn provide them a stable and um, efficient supply of food. Right? When the dry season occurs, the Anuak, you know what I'm saying? This is what they do. They grow their food. They collect and gather their food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But guess what? The Lao Neolithic, or uh, uh, Neolithic um, people, this ethnic group of what is called the Anuak, guess what blood type they have, or have a group that they have. They have E1B1A. A large amount of them have E1B1A. This is why they look just like or very similar to the people here in the so-called United States. If they was walking down the street, you wouldn't know no difference. They look just like us. Can you tell the difference? So I went back to my true ancestry. And it says, how do population relate to each other? While well, putting the selected moderate group Ethiopian and Nuwak. And look what came up. Number one, Bantu. <laughs> Bantu. I'll put it in another place of the of selected modern groups. Now notice that this is the closest ancient group is Bantu that the Ethiopian and Nuwak people are related to. Hence they have E1B1A. Now we have Ethiopian and Nuwak, which is um, the autosome, autosomal um, DNA, which is what? They said Ethiopian, I mean, excuse me, they said um, Sudanese, Sandawi, uh, Hassa, Maasai, San, Ethiopian, Gumus, and Mbuti, Pygmies. 
So they are related to the Pygmies. And who? The Bantu Northeastern or Northeast Bantu people. Right, so continue on. This is how Bantuic people look. Once again, can you tell the difference between her and her sister here in the, um, in the um, States? You can't. All right, so right here. Yeah, so right here we have, let's look at it. The tribes of India are also comprised of a very large number of blacks of Negro astroloid types whose relatives still live in parts of Africa today and are related to the Anu ethnic groups such as the black Negroes and Nuak with curly and kinky hair as well as straight and wavy hair, but black skin and Negro features as well as blood type. And Nu, which is who? The Twa people, Pygmies, all right, Tibo, and others. The Australian Aborigines are also related to the Anu group. So the ones in India, and the ones in Australia are related to the Anu group, showing that they was there, the Twa people, the Pygmies, the misnomer, the um, Anu people was there in Australia, in India, before the other people got there, in which that mixed them with the, um, mixed them with the Europeans, um, Albions or Caucasians over the last um, 6,000 years. It says right here that, Australian Aborigines was also related to the Anu group who were, who, um, who one lived, once lived in um, Sahara, South, um, North Africa, and also was found all over Asia, the Americas, Europe, Australia, China, Southeast Asia, Japan in ancient times, as I already said. So here it says, also continues on, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines still have a large number of black people of the African Negro type and the Negro Australoid type, be, um, both um, being of African origin, all right, or rather of the Twa, misnomer Pygmy, and new people origin. Australian Aboriginals and Southeast um, Asians, um, Austrics are both related to African Negro peoples and were among the first people from Africa to migrate. Don't have to use the word Negro when we know that the word is Anu, the Anu people, not the African Negro people, the Anu people. Okay? The Oceanic Negro, Papua New Guinea, Malaysian, the Tasmanian and Southeast Asians, as well as South Indian Negritos, as well as the King or Kong Bushmen, were the first people to migrate out of Africa after they developed a strong prehistoric culture in Africa over 100,000 years ago. So over a period of thousands of years, the original people in Asia were black African people, the Anu people. And if you go to Japan to this day, you have the Ainu people, A. Um, I N U, which is named after the A N U people, but they still reside um, within Japan to this day. This is actually who they was trying to get rid of during Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, or um, Nagasaki and um, Hiroshima. They were established in India for thousands of years before the Indo Europeans arrived. Actually, anthropologists say that it was Caucasians from the um, or tacking, which mixed with Indians, original black, Negroes, Austrian, or Australoid race. Right? Hence the term Indo-European. Yet despite the mixture, the vast majority of the Indo-Negroid people of India remains pure black, Negroid, and still to this day, even if they are not shown in Hollywood movies. Okay? So, we know that the Anu people was the first to enter into Egypt. You can get another book written by 
um, um, Charles Ledbetter, right? In his book, talking about the origin of Freemasonry, he speaks about that the Freemasonry came from the Anu people or the Twa people, and that they were the first to enter into Egypt. So now we have that bloodline of the Anu, of the Antu, which is the Bantu people, and then you have us going into Egypt. And so now we find that a lot of the Egyptians had E1B1A. Here you have the ancient Egyptians, combatants, Cumerians, belonging to E1B1A haplogroup from the 12th dynastic period. We have right here, this is my Y-DNA royal Egyptian bloodlines. All right? This is from the same um, mytrueancestry.com. And right here it says, Kanun Nakti, Ancient Egypt, Metacondrial Haplogroup M1A1, and why DNA haplogroup is uncertain. It's not uncertain. It's E1B1A. How I know is because it says right here, genetic distance is 24.077. Sample match is 98% closer than other users. Now, if my um, haplogroup is E1B1A, why DNA haplogroup is E1B1A, why don't they know his haplogroup when I am a 98% closer match than any other users? So that means anybody who is on, that means only 2%, all right, um, um, match like mine, 98% or higher, 99 to 100. But everyone else is below 98% who have done their DNA through mytrueancestry.com. So that means I'm 98% closer than any other um, any other users. And who am I related to? I'm related to Kanum Nakti, ancient Egypt. So his Y DNA had the group had to be E1B1A. You come down. It says right here, genetic um, distance is 93.734, matches 1% closer than other users. Then um, it says the um, Ptolemaic Egypt, and then it says E1B1B. It says genetic distance is 91.399, and it says 2% closer than other users. So the most DNA that I have in which that verifies my genetic connection is 98% and is closer to the genetics of Kanum Nakti of ancient Egypt. So let's see who Kanum Nakti is. Now, Nakti Ankh. As you see here, I'm related to too, which is the brother of um, Kanun Nati. So right here it says he has mitochondrial DNA in one A one. All right, age eighteen hundred BC. Genetic distance is twenty six point twenty seven. So here it says haplogroup in one A one is a branch of maternal tree of human. It ages 9,600 to 16,300 years old. Okay? His breast was born around 13,000 years ago if you just take the average between 9,600 um, to 16,300, about 13,000. Descendants of the lineage spread across much of North Africa and shores of Mediterranean region, the Levant region. Today, this line is most common in Ethiopian. Jews, 20%. So I'm related to the Ethiopian Jews. So right here, you find moderate scientific analysis of some ancient Egyptian mummies show distinct Nubian and African traits, parts of native Egyptian diversity. The two brother num mummies of the Middle Kingdom, 12th dynastic period, illustrates this diversity, which is indigenous, not foreign. So right here, this is Kanum Nakti who I'm 98% connected to. It appears that they were half brothers sharing a common mother. So this is through the mother. So I'm through the mother is connected to Nakti Ankh. But I am directly from Kanum Nakti. All of this um, evidence suggests that the younger of the two brothers, Kanum Nakti, had a Negro father. Well, actually, they're both Negro, as you can see. 
is estimated to have been 40 to 45 at the time of his death. The skull is markedly um, pro um, methos, powerful in appearance, and with a full set of teeth. All right, the elder brother, Naiti Ankh, is estimated to have been 60 years at his death. All right, so here it says, um, the slight variation in the inscription taken in conjunction with the men marked um, anatomical differences may indicate that their mother had two husbands and that the father, Kanum Nati, possessed Nubian ancestry. Much During much of the Egyptian history, there was a certain mingling of the people of Nubia with those of Egypt at all levels of society. Okay. Nubia or Nubians um, come directly from um, Ham. It was called um, his son's called, called um, Cush, grandson Cush. All right. Um, Ham is Cam, as in Kemet, Kemet. So this is the, actually the same people that they're talking about here. All right. Modern DNA test confirms African characteristics of two mummies. So they both are African. All right. So let's kill the noise when they're trying to make it different because it came from different fathers. So right here. These two um, control part of Egypt. It says, we study the kingship of two high-status Egyptians from the 12th dynastic period. So these are two um, high-status Egyptian king, kinship, I should say. It says, ancient DNA was extracted from the teeth of the two mummies. Subsequent was obtained after hybridization, capture of mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA. Now, remember now, they actually don't know the Y chromosome DNA of these two. Well, I can tell you specifically of Kanun Nati that it has to be E1B1A. Why? Because he's 90% connected to my DNA, which is E1B1A. Why DNA? Why? Both mummies belong to mitochondrial DNA M1A1, just another matriarchal or millennial relationship. Why DNA um, sequence shows variation, indicating that the two mummies had different fathers. So that means that Kanun Nati had E1B1A, but his brother had a different Y DNA haplogroup. Right? This confirms the African origin of the two individuals. You know, they had different Y DNA. They still prove that they are African origin of the two individuals. So I don't have a problem with the term African because I told you all before that the word is written in Egypt. Af means house. Afu means house, temple, church, as it now is used, all right? And Ra, of course, means light or sun. And then Ka means spirit, breath. So we are the spiritual light in the body. Afu also means body, temple. And remember, your body is the temple of God. So body and temple became synonymous. So Afu means body or temple. So this is the spiritual light inside of our temple. So the word Africa means spiritual light in the body. Okay? Talking about this electrical impulse in which that flows through the body via our soul, which is embedded inside of the pineal gland. The word soul is the word solar, as in sun. Then we have our solar plexus, a bundle of nerves in which that helps with the transmission throughout our body, of, uh, throughout specifically our torso and lower extremities of this solar energy, stemming from the pineal gland, which is the master gland of the physical body. Okay? So here, uh, we know that Mantu martial arts became the Chinese pronunciation Kung Fu which means the work of, accomplish, of the accomplished man. In fact, 2,600 BCE, which is 4,600 years ago, the Mantu martial arts was recorded by Prince um, Amin Imhet, all right? The 12th century um, tomb carvings in the tomb of Imhotep and on the tomb of the governors. Amin Imhet was also called Amin, which is the name means Amen is supreme. So Amenhet was the prince and governor of Menhes 
and the high official of the court of King Ursa Sin I. He was known as the great chief of Menhet, right? Amenhet ruled for 25 years from the time of Ursa Sin um, I, or Ursa, uh, um, Ursa Sin I, with the um, reign of King Amenhet II, King Amenhet grandfather and King Amenhet the first of the 12th dynastic period was the author of the famous testament of, um, of Amenhet and can be found in the Milligan papyrus and the papyrus Sillir the second. So who ruled during the time um, of Amenhet the second is the individual known as my ancestor Kanun Nakti. Uh, we know because right here, not T. That's for all intended purposes, as well as prints. Um, I'm in hex. Guess what? They would be considered the fathers of martial arts. For all intended purposes, he would be classified as the father of martial arts. My ancestor, not T. So, right here, not T was an ancient Egyptian local governor in Menat Khufu in Middle East. Egypt in the 12th dynasty or 12th dynasty. He was known for his decorative um, temple chapter BH 21 at, um, and BH means Ben Hassan 21. The decoration of his um, temple is most likely unfinished. Only, um, only one wall is partially decorated with paint, showing him standing in front of the workers in the marshes. Right? The inscription that provides the name and title of Nakti, here called Nakti. He was mayor and overseer of the eastern desert. Nakti is also mentioned in the temple tomb um, chapter of Kanum Hotep II, which is Beni Hassan III temple. In his chapter is a long biographical, um, biographical inscription reporting on the life of the governor, but also on his family. There is stated that Kanum Hotep I installed Nakti all right, as you see here, who, all right, you come down, Nakti um, as governor, all right, in Minat Khufu. Nakti lived in the first half of the 12th dynasty, most likely under Sinu, um, um, Sinu Rex and Amin Mhet II. Well, here it is. So this is during the time of um, Sinu Rex the first and Amin Mhet the second, as you see here. So, he was the mayor or governor, all right, over this area. And so you go to the Nagu pharaohs of Tamari have recorded their interest in athletic activities on the walls of their temples, all right. Sports in Tamari included martial arts or mantu arts or mentu arts. Grappling, wrestling holes, stick fighting, weaponry, boxing, punching, um, acrobatics, as well as archery and um, equestrian um, events, boating, and ball games. The oldest relief with wrestling scenes dating back to 2400 BC decorated the temple of Ptahotep and Akhet Hotep. Here it is. This is something here. This dates back to even further than 2400 BC. This is 5,000. Year old Egyptian grappling art, all right. Basically, it's called jetsu or jitsu or um, jujitsu. This is what you're seeing here. In other words, mixed martial arts, or what they call it today. So it's nothing new. This was on the walls of ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago. Here's another example of this. You see the grappling and wrestling holes and um, so forth and so on. So these carvings constitute the ancient record of the world's first martial arts system and their birthplaces in Africa, uh, Africa. Therefore, it is a common misconception that martial arts originated in Asia, China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan to be more Pacific or Okinawa. There was long before the Olympic Games became the Institute of Greece in the 8th century BC. At Beni Hassan, more than 4,000 wrestling scenes were found, martial arts scenes found dating from 2000 BCE and further back as we know 3000 BCE 5000 over 5000 years ago 
There we attend a number of athletic movements and postures of athletes and pairs, the wrestlers, the wearing belts, all right? Same thing as wearing belts. You see the same thing with them, um, of us tying the belts around um, as we go up the chain um, of, of white to um, black or red um, of our martial arts skill. Attempting to turn their opponents to their back to back and show the movement. There are pictographs, hieroglyphics, or metronature also found in the temple of Ramesses the third. Now, Ramesses the third is very important in um, Meninet Habu and is yes over 3,100 years old. In other words, over 5,122 years old. That is older than East Asian martial arts, which are only just above 2,200 years old, by the way. So you're comparing 2,200 years ago to 5,122 years ago of us having martial arts, as you see here. Stick fighting, as you see. Martial arts was stick fighting. So what they call Kali in the Philippines, we already had in Africa on the walls dating back nearly 5,000 years ago. Martial arts. Here are other things. One, two, three. A lot of grappling moves. Same thing that you see for all the people who want to watch MMA. Mixed martial arts. This was already done by us. Look at it. You see the exact same moves in mixed martial arts that you see here on the walls of ancient Egypt. There are many people in the world who will argue that Greece contained the oldest records of combative arts. As we already showed you, now, nah, you're talking about 5,000 years ago, not 776 BC. It was already ancient. In fact, even the word name Greece is derived from the ancient name of Africa of Negrita. Negritia, Negritia, Negritia becomes the word Niger, uh, Nigeria. That's where the word Greece comes from. It's from there. So present-day scholars is what commonly is known as the Greco-Roman wrestling attribute the origin of the sport to the illustration discovered on the walls of the tomb of the region of ancient Egypt called Mahas, which has later been named Bina uh, um, Hassan, or the hills of the son of the Hassan family, or Hassan that Arabic means handsome. So Bini means son of, so the son of the handsome. At Ben Hassan, in four separate tombs, there are hundreds of paintings of limestone walls that, for the most part, have since decayed. Well, we got them. The paintings on the um, African martial arts use a variety of wrestling holes and locks, as you see also stick fighting. The illustration um, total was more than 500 individual pairs of wrestlers. The Painting um, features pairs of fighters who are wrestlers as well as illustration of warriors using other forms of unarmed combats that explore kicking, punching techniques, in other words, martial arts. There are scenes of martial artists using weapons such as lance, short sticks, daggers, staff, bows, and arrows. There are other scenes of warriors utilizing military techniques such as testudo, which is a shield device using um, during the um, siege of a castle. These paintings in Africa represent the most ancient and prolific depiction of martial arts on earth. Here's some more. You can see some more of them. You can see them body slamming. You can see them doing grappling holes for submission. As you see here, there is a black belt um, on the fourth one down to the right. That's the black belt in which that um, was given in order to hold, um, to put around the waist show the advancement. As you can see, on some of these scenes, you can actually see 
the belt around the way. This is where the belt wearing and martial arts come from is off the walls of Beni Hassan at the Temple 27, 3000 BC. E, 5,000, over 5,022 years ago. Here's some more. Right. So, the leaders of the Amu of Shu, the word Amu are the same as Anu, your Middle Kingdom, the dynastic period of the 12th or 12th dynasty, originally from Egypt, Middle East. They have Ben Hassan, Temple of Kanu Hotep. All right. Leader of the Amu of Shu. All right. Anu, um, the Amu of Shu. The Anu people of Shu, right? Who are these people? <laughs> Originally from Egypt, Middle Egypt, Ben Hassan, Temple of Kanum, Kanum Hotep, all right? Right here it says, at this temple, this detail depicts two men wearing garments, beards, and hairstyles that identify them as a people from Western Asia. All right, no, not Western Asia. He depicts them coming from the land of Canaan, Israel. All right, these are the descendants of who we refer to as Abraham. Actually, these are the people of Amit Nhet. Amit Nhet was Abraham. Uh oh. Uh oh. I just solved the mystery for you. So, Amit um, Nhet also had E1B1A as his relative who he made it put in charge of the Beni Hassan structured temples and of the martial arts. But remember he was Prince I mean Mhet. Now you have Kanum Nati, the governor of that territory. And here you have their descendants called the Habaru or the Hebrew people. This is who this is. As you see them here. How we know is because you can look at their dress is more colorful and they also have fringes on their dresses, on their dress. as compared to the Egyptians. As you can see, they are basically the exact same color. In fact, on the walls of ancient Egypt, you can see it a little bit better here, as they have afros. Right here it says, the painting shows Asiatics in the center of registry. So the Asiatics, this is who the Hebrews were called, was the Asiatics, the Haber rules. In the 18th dynastic period, I won't get into this one. We we'll go to the 20th dynastic period if we can get a clear overstand of what's going on. So we're talking about from the 12th dynastic period to the 15th, 18th dynastic period, we had the Hyksos or the Havaru people ruling the throne of Egypt. We're talking about for over 500 years. Now we have them coming back on the throne during the 20th dynastic period. And how we know is because the same um, haplo group is on the throne. It says ancient Egypt, the ancestors you see is the Valley of the Kings. Egyptians, uh, 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 Egyptologists, uh, Kemetologists, they love talking about the Valley of the Kings. Well, go back and uh, um, analyze uh, those who had sat on the throne during that time of the 20th dynastic period, and you find that they had E1B1A. Ma, here we go. As you see here, and as you see, also ancient Egypt, and as you see, Valley of the Kings is who? Ramesses the Third. And we just talked about Ramesses the Third. If you remember, Ramesses the Third. Let's go back to Ramesses the Third. 
You talking about Ramesses the third? You have to go back and look. All right. Ramesses the third. All right. All right, so we talk about Ramesses the third, so we're gonna show you more connection between that. So right here we find your royal breakdown, because remember we're talking about those from the royal bloodline. The royal bloodline is E1B1A, y'all. And so right here it says ancient Egypt, ninety six point one percent. So I am 96.1% related to, as you see here, they have the head of Tutankhamun, a king type. But when you look here at the connection piece in ancient Egypt, it is E1B1A who is what? Ramesses the third. Ramesses the third. And remember, I'm not the only one. Remember, we said that 50 to 75% of the so called blacks, African Americans in America, have. E one B one A. So that means that they have we have the same ancestry. Fifty to seventy five percent of us. Means that we are related to Ramesses the third, who sat on the throne of ancient Egypt, but just like his relatives from the Hyksos dynasty or what's called the Havaru dynasty of the um fifteenth through the eighteenth dynasty, as well as also from the twelfth dynastic period came back on the throne during this, during this time of the 20th dynastic period. And who is Ramesses III? He's Ursha Mayat Ra, or Ray. Marianne, or uh, Marianne, uh, uh, Mary uh, Moon, all right, Ramesses III, the second pharaoh of the 12th dynastic period, or the 20th dynastic period in ancient Egypt. He is thought to have reigned from March 26, 11. 86 to April 15, 1155 BC, and is considered to be the last great monarch of the new kingdom to wield any substantial um, authority over Egypt. His long reign saw the decline of Egyptian politics or political and economic power, linked to a series of invasions and internal economic problems that was also plagued pharaohs before him. He also been described as a warrior pharaoh due to his strong military strategies. He led the way by defeating the invaders known as the Sea Peoples. So, God damn it, if we related to him by 96.1% and more, because i seen one brother who had 100% connection. So, um, if this is the case, then guess what? That means we have the straightest the greatest strategy or the greatest potential of strategy to come out from under the Albion. Because that means that we can figure our way out of this bullshit. So I want those who have E1B1A for us to form a council so that we can figure out this shit because we have the greatest potential. In this case, we are God's chosen people. And I'll continue on and prove what I'm talking about. Right, so right here, he was able to save Egypt from collapse at a time when many other empires fell due to late Bronze Age. However, the damage of the invasions took a toll on Egypt. So here it is, Ramesses the Third. He was the son of King um, Setnakti and Queen Tai Merinasi. All right. Egyptologists believe Ramesses III to be the grandson of Ramesses II, and he ruled for over 31 years. The next three rulers of Egypt, Ramesses IV, V, and VI, were all his sons. Thus, they all have what? E1B1A, because it, um, it runs through the mail. It runs through the mail. All right? So this is Ramesses at Khonsu. This is how he looks, and you see, melanated brother. All right, I have the same complexion of him today. 
as being 96.1 percent related to him. My wife is 94.4 percent, so she's 95 percent related to him. I'm 96 percent related to him. So we so we are direct descendants of Ramesses the third. You have to see from um, um, how close you are related to him, and you can do that by way of doing your uploading your DNA test that you did 23andMe um, onto my true ancestry or any other place that you did it, myheritage.com or africanancestry.com or ancestry.com. Get the book, Ramesses III, Father of what? Ancient America. Oh, wow. So this is, this is why this is important, y'all, because it shows you that Ramesses III not only sat on the throne of Egypt as a Shemite, Semite, a Hebrew, a Habaru, but he also was the father of ancient America. God damn, I just destroyed all the mythology. That's why in the class, in this past class, I was saying, poof, poof, niggas. Ali. Oh, you lucky Trump election? Yeah. You just you destroyed the founding yeah. father's bullshit, brother. Yeah. <laughs> The founding fathers. <laughs> yeah, this is the right. Hey, all the founding fathers got destroyed. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All the founding fathers got destroyed. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Now we know who all the real founding fathers. Ramesses the third, your relative, and this is going to R. A. Rasabal. So right here, he says that. Chief claim to fame of Ramesses III had been his conquest of the Sea People, his, which who are the Palestinians or Philistines, as it was anciently called. His temple walls at Meninet um, Habu depicts the naval battle, the first such pictorial or pictured memorially. If Egypt had fallen, then the combined Mediterranean powers its history might have been very different. But again, had he not sent an expedition to the far west of the world, the transformation of Metro America would have been, would have come about and taken a turn and taken a turn that he did. It would not have come about and taken a turn that he did. So why did he send fleets over here? Because he called for his brothers who was here in the Americas to come over there but we can the ass. <laughs> when stock is taken of the achievement of the pharaohs, it says Ramses the third will have to be accorded the double distinction, savior of Egypt and father of the Omec Mexico. The father of Omec Mexico, the father of Omec Mexico, the father of America is Ramses the third. The father of ancient America. And you and I are directly related to him. Mm. Wow. That's deep. So that means that we are the fathers of ancient America. Oh, shit. Keep going you can't... deeper and deeper, brother. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. This is the point. Keep brother. going deeper and deeper, brother. <laughs> the mother culture. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We got to the mother culture. It says many historians consider the Olmec civilization a mother culture of Mesoamerica. Well, we just showed you who's the father of ancient America and who the father of Olmec Mexico. So the Olmecs, which are the ancient Egyptians, because Ramses was the Egyptian, but also a Semite. The Hebrew or Habaru at the same time. This was his distinction. So his double distinction was that he was Pharaoh or the Gu of ancient Egypt, the savior of Egypt, and at the same time, the father of Omec Mexico, the father of ancient America. It says many historians consider the Omec civilization a mother of Mesoamerica. A mother culture is a way of life that strongly influences later cultures. The Omex 
Empire led to the development of other civilizations such as the Maya, the Aztec, the Incas, the Toltec. So, now that you know that the Egyptians were the fathers and mothers of America, are they called Indians? Yes, you get AA a nativearts.com right slash ancient hyphen indians right slash omex dot htm ancient indian civilization so they called the egyptian culture the nubian egyptian culture they called them indians so why don't they allow for you to use the term indian today a matter of fact they don't have a problem with you using the term indian but when you get to using the term more Oh, they got a serious problem. Oh shit! You a boy? Oh, oh, you you part of the sovereign citizen movement? <laughs> Are you really? Because sovereign citizens don't have a fucking nationality. They don't have a nationality, y'all. Sorry, they don't. Because white um, folks say that they no, come from Germany, they come from Ireland, they come from Scottish. They come from or Scotland, rather. They come from um, um, Nav um, um, Scandinavia, um, Scandinavia, or whatever they call it. They come from Yugoslavia. They come from um, Russia. They come from. You get the you get the drift. That's their ancestry. But we just showed you that the Olmecs are called Indians, and they are the mother culture as well. That the fact they are ancient Egyptians and Nubians. They came from out of Egypt and Nubia. So Ryan says the Olmec Indians are often regarded as the mother culture of the late Middle American civilization. The Olmec Indians were a culture of ancient people who lived about 1300 to 4000 BC in the eastern Mexican lowlands. Some researchers have um, 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 descended from, say that they descended from Asia. Others say that they uh, were from Africa. The Olmec people called themselves she as in pronounced she, or as in Xi'an. You go to um, the Xi'an providence of China, you can see pyramids there. They built the pyramids there. They came from out of um, Asia. But because they could sell, they also were from Egypt, as you've seen, the Nubians from there. This is proven. So that means that the, in ancient times, Asia was ruled by the Egyptians. By the Nubians. See, we just destroyed all the fairy tales. So we find out that the Habarus or Hyksos of the 12th dynastic period, the 15th through the 18th dynastic period, um, or the beginning of the 18th dynastic period, all the way to the um, into the 12th dynastic, um, 20th dynastic period, we find that the Hebrew Israelites belong to the E1B1A haplo group. All right. So we said the Hebrew Israelites royal bloodline haplo group is E1B1A. All right. Continue on. All right. So we go back. We was talking about the Anuak or Anuak people, as you see them, and you will see. Direct correlation to them because guess what? Right here, your closest genetic moderate population is what? Number one is who? Ethiopian and Nuak is mine. As you see here, Dr. Ali Mel Bay in the upper right hand corner at gmail.com. And what was it? MyTrueAncestry.com. I put in ancient Kenyan. Now, Yarindi. Or Narindi, Rock Shetter. And when I put that in, it brought up my closest genetic moderate population, and it is Ethiopian and Nuak, which means I am, which has 4.043. Anything lower than a 5 means that you are directly related and connected. So that means I am a direct descendant of 
the Anunnaki is. Mystery clothes. If you have Ethiopian Anuak in your DNA chart, then that means that you are an Anunnakian. You just shut Zachariah Sitchin down and any of these imposters writing books about the goddamn Anunnakian. I am Anunnakian. Period. See how you shut this shit down with DNA? Proof. This is evidence. Receipts. Facts. Can't be dismissed. We come down, number eight is what? Ethiopian Jewish. I'm an Ethiopian Jew. I'm also an Ethiopian Jew. That means that I'm related to Jesus. If you say that he existed, if you say that he existed, then that would be the same correlation. But we do know that there was someone called Yahshua. Because guess what? A planet don't go, go without a Messiah at any time. There are always messengers, hence where the word Messiah comes from, a Mashiach. The word Messiah or Mashiach comes from the word Messiah. So right here we see Ethiopian Jewish, which would be the black Jews from out of Ethiopia. Who said else? Who else said that it was from a black Jew from out of Ethiopia? I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you what we're talking about here in a second. So here, E1B1A, we come down, ancient Egypt, ancestral seat, once again, Valley of the Kings, and Ramesses III, E1B1A. And it says Royal Haplo Group, E1B1A, match. <clears throat> it says subclan distance is zero. It means direct line. 96.1%. So we find out, according to Dr. Yehoshua Ben Ephraim, leader and founder of the E1B1A DNA teachings, our DNA proves we are Israelites, but not just Israelites, as I showed you. But we sat on the throne of ancient Egypt. From the, off and on from the 12th dynastic period to the 20th dynastic period and beyond. And possibly before the 12th dynastic period. This is proven now through DNA. Can't bypass it. Can't miss it or dismiss it, I should say. So, the final call. Minister Farrakhan says blacks, true children of Israel. Mr. Vicon reveals black American place in prophecy and uncovers synagogue of Satan. Well, everybody uncovered that because that's in Revelation the second chapter, third verse, ninth verse, and Revelation the third um, verse and the ninth, um, third chapter, ninth verse. It is both Israel, the chosen nation, predestined by the highest Yahuwah, by Ben, uh, Doctor Benny Yah, um, Yashirel. So let's get to that. So if you go and put in Coptic Egyptian, guess what pulls up? Look, let's look at what pulls up. Check this out. Egyptian, right? Palestinian, American, Manasseh tribes. Well, hold up. That's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They do it. Jordan. Sumerian Levi tribe. That's one of the tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. And the Yemenite Jewish. So this is who the Coptic Egyptians are part of. So the Egyptians aren't Manias and Levi and the Yem um, Yemen or Yemenite Jewish Jews? Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? But well, it says right here, Samaritan Moshia, a man of Manasseh, excuse me, tribe, and the Samaritan Levi tribe. Wow. 
So when I put in Coptic Egyptian, which I'm also that too, it pulled up. And I'm part of the Levi tribe and Manias tribe. Wow. Well, we continue on because it shows you the tribe that you part of as far as the 12 tribes of Israel coming from out of Egypt. <laughs> so you got these Egyptians or Kimites or Kimiologists or Kimologists or Kimiologists or however you want to say it battling against the Hebrew Israelites and vice versa. And they're both silly. Because they don't do DNA testing, this is what happens. They don't know that they're the same people. He said, how do relate, um, populations relate to each other? So this is directly relationship, y'all. Coptic, Egyptian, Egyptian, Samaritan, Manassas tribe, Samaritan, Levi tribe, the Yemenite, Jewish tribe. All related. In the discussion, this destroys the debates in which that Sarnetta is having with these Hebrew Israelites or Hebrews against the Egyptians because they have the same E1B1A proven. Ramesses the third, E1B1A. Dr. Aileen Bay, E1B1A. Kunum Nati, E1B1A. This is what this shows. So, we go to Yemenites, Jewish, and look what happens. Same thing. Samaritan, Manasseh's tribe. Samaritan, Levi tribe. Hmm. So regardless if I put in Yemenite Jewish population or Coptic Egyptian or Egyptian, this is what pulls up. So that means, once again, blacks, true children of Israel or Hebrew Israelites at the same time, we sat on the throne of ancient Egypt from the Valley of the Kings, Ramesses the third. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. Well, but see, this is what happens when you study DNA. It ends the mysteries. All that damn debate shit is over. Let's look at it. There's some dispute as to whether the following picture of Yemenite Jews taken in 1901 by Herman um, Burchard are Israelites. Well, I can tell you that they are. The following images were kept away. That's why it was kept away. But was released to the public on the Hasserat uh, website on May 4th. 2017, under the publication title, First Ever Photograph or Photo of Yemen's Jews Stun the Jewish World. And guess the people in which that's descended from these Yemen Jews. As you see, I am. That's one of my close populations of relationships. Is Yemenite Jewish? As you see, Coptic. Egyptian, you see an Egyptian on the upper one, and you hear Sumerian, Manias, Levi tribe, and you see here Egyptian. So, same people. These people are referred to as the Jewish community in Sanaa. What makes the image and the name of their community even more credible is that the Limba tribe claimed that their ancestors were from Sanaa and made a brief stop in Yemen before continuing further into Africa. The Limba claims importance because the Limba were DNA tested and proven to be linked to the line of Levi. Well, DNA just that. The Yemenite Jewish people, as you see here, the Samaritan Levi tribe. Wow, just proved it. DNA just proved it. So when people say that DNA is important, they are dummies. They don't want to know who they really are. And this whole science on planet Earth is to know thyself. To know thyself. The true descendancy of Jacob, who is Israel, that is the true descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel, shall carry one and only unshared why DNA have no group, which were really 
give the true meaning of having God's or being God's chosen people. With one unshared white DNA haplogroup, only for them. On the other side, the Gentiles with all the other shared white DNA haplogroups on the other. According to the scriptures and true histories that are backed up scientifically, as we've seen through DNA, the Y DNA haplogroup E1B1A was found and confirmed to be the only, God damn, the only haplogroup which is not racially shared. Wow. This is not shared with white folks, pale folks. We can get them light as hell. Some even might pass away, but these are knuckles. Hence, those who carry it should obviously be the true Israelites. Mm -hmm. We are. We just showed you that the closest genetic modern population, as you see down here, is Ethiopian Jewish. We just showed you that it's Yemen Jewish, Samaritan Manassas. Samaritan Levi tribe and Egyptian. Also, Saudi. The Saudi, oh wow. The Palestinian, oh wow. The Bendoan, which who are who? The Berbers, the Moors, and Jordanian. Hmm. So, let's get this book. Stephen Jacobs, The Hebrew Heritage of Black Africa. Moses Farah, he says, this is what Stephen Jacobs says, he who lives in America or accustomed to thinking in terms of European language and culture. This applies to black people as well as white. Negroes is the word for Spanish derivative, colored, and black or English words. Rarely does the black man think of himself as a descendant of Ashanti, Monty, Yoruba, or other West African ethnic groups. Yet he remains a person with the same heritage, the same historical experiences and background, and the same kindred feelings and emotions as most of other black African descent. In this same sense, such as a person have a black Israelite heritage, whether he used the term or not, or whether he knows it or not. Most of us don't know it. Because both of us have not taken the DNA test to find out for sure. Because these words are not customarily used by most black Americans. Remember, they just think that they Christian. They are good Christian because I want to eat pork. But they are actually black Israelites by heritage. Remember, 50 to 75% of us are black Israelites or Israelite heritage. Hebrew Israelite by heritage, by blood, by half a group. By DNA. But most black Americans do not mean they do not apply. So right here it says, because these words are not customarily used, in other words, you don't use black Israelite or African Israelite or Hebrew Israelite, whatever term that you want to use. By most um, black Americans, does not mean that they do not apply. You should claim your heritage as Hebrew. Because as you see, your closest genetic modern history is, or population is Ethiopian Jewish, will be also Yemenite, Egyptian, Levi, Manassas, et cetera, et cetera. So the haplogroup group most often associated with this expansion, which is the Bantu expansion, is E1B1A which constitute up to 48% of the African male gene pool. So if you have a girl and you have E1B1A, a little girl, then she would be from the gene pool of E1B1A also. The presence of E1B1A lineage outside of Africa can typically be associated with events that occurred after the Bantu expansion such as the trade in African slaves, which is only 15% of your ancestry. The other 85% of us was already here. And it says it right here, it says, or the Moorish occupation of Iberia, which, of course, is um, um, Iberia is what we refer to as Portugal and Spain. 
So that means that the Moors came here in 1492 to the Americas. But even before that, we know that Abu Bakari II came 200 years before that. Nearly 200 years before that. He came in 1310 through 1313. Abu Bakari II brought 20,000 to 200,000 people from out of Mali. That would be the Dogon and the Mandinka people who also have E1B1A. <laughs> Isn't that something? The same people that they claim that they bought on the slave trade happens to be the same people in which the Abu Bakari the second bought 200, nearly 200 years before the slave trade. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Here it is. So now it went from 48%. Now we see 60% African Americans equals E1B1A. In our population, 60% of the African Americans belong to HGE3A, which is E1B1A. It goes further. This is a um, doctor um, um, from out of the Igbo clan of the Jews in Nigeria. And he says it goes as high as 70 to 75 percent of African Americans have the same DNA as the Igbo Jews and are Hebrew Israelites by blood. Mm. Wow. So we're talking about between 50 to 75 percent have to three fourths of the Negroes in America, so called African Americans or Hebrew Israelites by blood and carry E1B1A. So this is why I can talk about E1B1A because half of you niggas to a third of three fourths of you niggas have Hebrew blood, Israelite blood, and are related to the ancient Egyptian king Ramesses the third, who sat on the throne of Egypt, hence you are Egyptian. Fifty to seventy-five percent of you. And it's from your bloodline that will bring Christ, Jesus, to the planet Earth. <laughs> it is from your bloodline and no one else's. Because I just showed you the reason why we're God's chosen people. You have nine series DNA. You have the highest potential for genius. Jesus is going to return in no damn eight species or one above the eight species who's calling themselves Homo sapiens sapiens. You are the only Homo sapiens sapiens or the only Homo Christos people on the planet Earth. Sorry. Sorry. And 50 to 75% of you niggas right in America. Take it or leave it alone as, as Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to tell them niggas in the nation of Islam. Take it or leave it alone. Most African Americans are E1B1A. That's what we know. So pay attention. Get your damn test done. Find out your lineage. It's verification of who you are. And let's band together as a new nation of Hebrew Israelite Egyptians who sat on the throne of ancient Egypt as Shemites and Moors of the Khalifa who ruled Iberia, Spain, Portugal. So we are Moors, we are Egyptians, and we are Hebrew Israelites. All have E1B1A. Discussion is over. I destroyed every last so-called group. If they don't bear witness to this information, they are liars, and you don't need to join them. Get the fuck away from them as fast as possible. Because as Dr. Collins said, we are global people, or in this case, a worldly people. 
and you want to claim a goddamn spot or the whole thing. By me doing what I'm doing, we claiming the whole goddamn thing. Egypt is in Africa. Levant is in what we call Palestine. Israel, which is actually Africa. Saudi Arabia is in Africa. The Yemenites are there in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia and down in Yemen, which is part of Saudi Arabia. We're claiming the Americas. Because I just showed you that this royal bloodline went through 50 to 75 percent of us, right into Americas. So if you want to leave America and go to Africa, you can. Your brothers and sisters are there with E1B1A. You can go to Saudi Arabia, Yemen. Your brothers are there. You can go into India, as I showed you earlier. You can go there. You can go to Australia, to Aborigines. E1B1A is there. You come here into the Americas. E1B1A is here. We have scattered our people around the world with E1B1A. It's Bantu expansion. And I showed you who the Bantu are. The Bantu people are the children of Antu. Enu are the pygmies, the Twa people, the Taites, or Pataites, or Pataf. The Anu people. And Anu and Antu were husband and wife, according to, to the Sumerian tales. Anu is the word on within ancient Egypt, which means Heliopolis, which means the city of the sun. Wow. We are called the children of the sun. Wow. You see how we destroy all of this divisiveness, all this fucking left hemisphere thinking? I'm right hemisphere thinking. I can put all this shit together. This is what a God does. With all this goddamn linear thinking, all this fucking divide and conquer, the only thing these motherfuckers doing is following the goddamn pale man's program of divide and conquer with the left hemisphere thinking asses. And many of them believe that they come from the monkey. And I already destroyed that monkey theory shit in the beginning of this presentation. We're older than the fucking eight species. And we humanize the eight species by putting our DNA into them. And who did that? <laughs> the gods that was here over 30 million years ago. The Anu people. That's the reason why they said Anu was the god of the Sumerian tales. Who we now know are the Twa people via the Ethiopians. And so we see the same connections over and over again as this is why you see Ethiopian, ancient Ethiopian, or Ethiopian Jewish, or Ethiopian, which is Coptic Ethiopian. Same people, over and over again. Now you see Yahud. Yahud is short for Yahuda, Southern Levant. Who is Yahuda? Yahuda is Judah. So this right now says matches Judah. This is my ancestral globe here. And it says, show the match. What does it say? It says, Bronze Age, Yahuda, or Yahud, Southern Levant, 2250 BC. Showing that I'm from the bloodline of Judah. Wow. Which verifies the Ethiopian Jewish portion, which we just went over. But we're going to continue getting into it because right here it says Bronze Age, 3511-50 B.C. was a formative period in the southern Levant, a region that included present-day what? Israel. You see? Before the Palestinians were there, we was there. Jordan, Lebanon, the Palestinian Authority, and who? Southwest Syria. This area would end in a large-scale civilization collapse around this region and shape later periods, both demographically and culturally. The following Ice Age, which is 1150 to 586 BCE, raised, saw the rise, the rise of the territorial um, uh, uh, kingdoms such as biblical Israel, Judah, Amun, 
Moab, as in Moabites, as in Moors, and around Damascus, as well as the Phoenician city-states. Okay, here it is. In much of the late Bronze Age, the region was ruled by who? The Imperial Egypt. Egypt ruled that motherfucker. Egypt ruled what we now call Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, the Palestinian Authority, and the Southwest Syria. Although in later phases of the Iron Age, it was controlled by the Mesopotamian centered empires of Assyria and Babylonia. Same people. We come down, and it says here. But most importantly, we've identified the subclan E1B1A1 as part of the people who was identified as the Bantu people. The large population shift the article talked about is presumably the Bantu expansion from West Africa. And yet, E1B1A1 is the very same DNA haplogroup of the Netu, all right, of the Netu Fians, the Netu Fians in Israel and the Middle East, tested positive for, along with E1B1B1B1, which I believe is found in Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. So you have two bloodlines, E1B1A1, and you have E1B1B1B1. So you have E1B1A, and you have E1B1B. Why they keep talking about these? Why, why they talk about these two? Well, let's look at it. E1B1 is actually right here. As you say, E1B1A1 is from where? Israel. So that shows you that the Hebrew Israelites were from Israel, and they came from out the land of Canaan, because that's what it was called Canaan, the land of Canaan. You know, it was the land of the Phoenicians, and they was the Habarus or Hyksos, and they came into Egypt and took the throne of Egypt and sat on the throne for 500 years. 500 years, y'all. So not only did we rule Europe, the Iberia Peninsula, which is on what we call Portugal and Spain for 800 years, we ruled Egypt for over 500 years. God damn it. The same Hebrew Israelite line, the same Shemitic line, the same biblical line, E1B1A. That's why the Bible tells you that Jesus had hair like lamb's wool and feet as if it was burnt in the furnace. Those are the characteristics of only one people on the planet Earth. Woolly hair and black ass feet. As long as they didn't say their feet were ashy, I'm all right. <laughs> so right here, according to the um, Kiba Negas, Glory of the Kings. That's the name of the book. Makita, Queen Makita, the Queen of Sheba, as she's called. And King Solomon had a son together, and his name was Menelik the First, originally named Inala Hakim, son of the son of the wise. Even his name seems to suggest that there may have been truth to the story. He was considered the first um, Solomonic Empire uh, Emperor of Ethiopia. If the story is true, it would mean that Menelik and his lineage were from the tribe of Judah. Why? Because Solomon was from the tribe of Judah. Because David, his father, was from, allegedly, the tribe of Judah. The Bible also makes a strange reference, but contains no explanation as to why it was made. Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? I showed you that the Ethiopians also had E1B1A. The Israelites had E1B1A. The tribe of Judah had E1B1A. The ancient Egyptians had E1B1A. I've proven all of this already. See, this is how you use history and DNA to verify who you are in history. And you can't get away from it. Haplogroup E1B1A which is also V38, right here. Haplogroup E1B1A1 founded in Africa, especially among Negro, no, excuse me, Niger's, or Niger, Congo-speaking population, formerly E3A. You have haplogroup E1B1A2, 
which is M329, found in Africa, especially in who? Ethiopia, among a Motic speaking population, formerly E3. So E1B1A and um, 2 and E1B1A1, both found in Africa, both among the Negro or Niger, um, Congo, and Ethiopian Omotic speaking people. Ethiopia. So once again, this shows that Ethiopians didn't just have E1B1B, they also had E1B1A, meaning that there was Hebrews there, which means these so-called Phalashians were from there. This proves DNA can prove Jewish ancestry of African tribes. That's what this headline carries. It says the most thorough analysis yet of the divergence of sequences in the human mitochondrial DNA has been carried out. The results suggest views that modern humans originated in Africa. That's fine. Now let's see the human evolution. A start for population genomic, nature 609, 652, 653, 653. Seven, December 2000. Um, Tactius, the Roman historian said many again say that the Jews were a race of Ethiopian origin. Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakinet, in his book, We the Right Jews, We the Black Jews, right? It is certain that ancient Hebrew customs and practices whose lineage originated in Africa were adopted by, the, uh, by that of white Jews in Europe. Rabbi Luther's heard of the hundreds of thousands of black Jews living in various parts of the world, such as Africa, Asia, India, Arabia, and Caribbean islands, South America, and North America. Now, this is everywhere that I just finished telling you that we existed at earlier over the presentation. The Phalashians, or black Jews of Ethiopia, are probably very ancient. They claim lineage descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is also Israel. Not just allegorically, but physically, calling themselves Beta Israel, the chosen people. The chosen people. All right, so let's look. You get the book, The Lost Jews, Last of the Ethiopian Phalashians. No, not the last, because we right here in America. Right? You can look at their features and their faces and their hair, and you can say that this is definitely us. The Phalashians, The Short History of the Ethiopian Jews by David Kessler. The other book here, The Lost Jews, is by Louis Rappaport. So get this New York Times um, magazine, um, uh, 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 New York Times newspaper, Thursday, February the 4th, 1971, and it says Ethiopian black Jews are building in the wilderness. It says promised land for 23,000 black Phalashian Jews. The Phalashians whose primary form of Judaism survived more than 2,000 years in isolation from other Jews. So that's how we know that they had the right shit. Okay, the term Falashian, by what they usually are known, means stranger or immigrant, because they came from out of um, Ethiopia. Into, I'm um, assuming, from out of Canaan, the land of Canaan, which is um, uh, uh, um, Israel, Palestine, as it's now called, into Ethiopia. In ancient Ethiopian language, Geese, they refer to themselves as Beta Israel, or the House of Israel. The Phalashians believe that they, like other Ethi um, Ethiopians, are descendants of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, the Queen of Sheba was Hermetic, all right? And King Solomon was Shemetic. And the Shemites and the Hamites always dwelt together, all right? So a portion of, as you've seen, um, we talk about 50 to 75% um, of us or Shemitic, which means Hebrew Israelites, but that means that there's 25 to 25% um, to 50% um, or what is called 52%, which are not Shemitic. They are R1B, they are um, or A, they are um, other particular E1B1B or some other type of, of like I give you a good example um, they did a haplo group test a haplotype test on Martin Luther King 
we have I haplogroup. Martin Luther King was not even a Hebrew Israelite. He had I haplogroup. See, they can't kill, all right, E1B1A. This is why the story tells you within the Quran that Jesus was not crucified. Someone else took his place. Right here. Colossians. Yeah, his, his shit probably died to something. I don't know what happened. Logged off. I don't know what happened. Yeah, he's been on for like six hours. Right. <laughs> Going in six hours straight. No breaks. I appreciate those. Yeah, appreciate those that are still hanging on. Um, all right, let, let's start. Um, as I say, they cut me off. So, all right, right here. All right, so Colossians having the black skin of their fellow Ethiopians and speak Amharic, the national language. They also follow local customs, such as removing their shoes before entering a place of worship. Same as Muslims do. All right. So right here it says their religion, however, is a primitive brand of Judaism that is all their own. It is based almost entirely on biblical sources and until they were discovered by Europeans in the 19th century, they had never heard of the Talmud, the Mishnah, the uh, Feast of Paris, Purim, and the Hanukkah and other elements of the post-biblical um, rabbinic, um, rabbinic um, traditions. And that's good. So what? That's European um, um, shit that they made up. Our fathers were surprised to learn that there were um, other black Jews, says um, Ashnu um, Siddiqui, a 29-year-old um, Israelite trained teacher here. They thought they were the only ones, of course, but they're not even Jews. And I'll get to this in a second. Colossians consequently called their religion leaders priests in the tradition of the um, Torah and strictly um, followed the Mosaic law regarding diet, festivals, um, um, circumcision, and the ritual purification. The only um, consp um, conspiracy um, concession to the rabbinic Judaism was the abandonment about 50 years ago of the animal sacrifice. Right, so, Dr. Lean. So, oh, is, you don't see it? Nah, it's not up. Okay, let me make sure. All right, let's get to it. Also, you might want to record it, too. I don't know if you have to start the recording over when you came in. Nah, nah, nah. It's, it's still going. Appreciate that. Yeah, every time I get back going, it goes back to recording. So, uh, appreciate that, guys. Thank you, thank you. All right, so, so this, this is the... Um, Hebrew Israelite tradition that we're supposed to be following. Or there's other shit, it's some made up shit of the pale Jews. Okay? Um, so we don't have to do anything except um, 
traditions of the Torah, strictly following the Mosaic um, laws regarding diet, festival, circumcision, and ritual purification. All right? Everything else is for not. And even the fact that about 50 years ago, um, they abandoned animal sacrifice. Right? So even though they are Hebrew Israelite, guess what happened? The rabbis, European Albion rabbis, this, um, discriminate against them. So it says that our people um, came back to Ethiopia, the teacher said. Um, they say that we are not true Jews because they don't study that bullshit. All right? So right here, as you see here, you have to try. This is what we call we, the black Jews, volume one and two by Yusef um, Ben Yakinen. Anybody know who's Dr. Ben? Dr. Ben said he was a Hebrew Israelite. Negroes forget about that. But he also was, what, a master at the Egyptian information and history. He knew it was the same. Dr. Ben said he don't even know why. He, when, when he was there in the front row at the SETI debate, all right, they call it a SETI debate because they claimed that he won, but he didn't win. Because I'm the one who had genetic information, Dr. Ben's information, um, uh, 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 um, John Henry Clark's information. He didn't show nobody from John. He didn't show John Henry Clark. He didn't show Dr. Ben. He didn't show nobody um, information that he claimed that he was a student of. I'm a student of all of these brothers and have been since I was damn 12 years old. This is one of the first books that I have. It's called We the Black Jews. Dr. Ben said he was a um, hero. And he said this right here in the book. Tribes of Israel from whom the Philosophers originated. These are the tribes. Reuben, Simeon, J um, Judah, Ishakar, Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulon, Manasseh, which is Joseph, Dan, Asher, Nephetali, and Gad. All right? Dr. Ben. He says that he's Ephraim and Gad in all your author's tribes. He, but he says that most of us are from Dan. Judah and Dan are the same, all one. Right here. This is my um, trueancestry.com. It says ancient Ethiopia, one um, I5950, and it says it's what? E1B1A, 2BA. So, Ancient Ethiopians is E1B1A blood type, which is Hebrew Israelite. Dr. Ben say that his family is from Ethiopia, all right, as well as his other part of his family is from Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans have high amounts of E1B1A. Ethiopians, as you see here, had E1B1A. This is how we found the bloodline of the tribes of Israel, E1B1A. All 12 tribes of Israel have E1B1A and its subclans. In alignment with Beta Israel traditions, Philosians Hebrews, it says, Eladad identified himself as being from the tribe of Dan. Due to this fact that I have Ethiopian Jewish heritage or Jew heritage as well, means that I have Judah Dan bloodline too. The tribe of Dan and Judah are the same. The Bible says that both of them refers to the lion that wept. So you have Judah, Reuben, Gad, Aser, Nephitim, um, Nephitim, Antilim, um, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ishakar, Zebulon, Joseph, Benjamin, and the 13th one would be Dinah, who is the daughter. So Dan is missing from the list according to the Holy Bible, Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Repetitives of the Law. A re, a repet. It says 3322. Dan is a lion's wept. This is the same thing. This is the exact same description of Judah in the Holy Bible, Old Testament, Genesis, beginning, lineage 49 9. Judea or Judah is a lion wept. Therefore, the real reason for Dan being missing in the Dan um, is that Dan and Judah are one and the same. So, as you see here, this is. The book of Revelation. You don't have Dan in the mix. So therefore, Dan is missing because Dan and Judah are one. This is also the reason why Manasseh, the son of Joseph, had to replace Dan in Revelation 7-6. They see Manasseh right there. 
Manassas is called the mind to forget. He represents understanding the faculty of the mind. Also, Dana, all right, or Dinah, um, or who is the 13th, who is a woman, means her mitochondrial DNA, which obviously um, was the M DNA and came by way. Next was the L DNA, which means judge is never mentioned at all. However, her meaning just happens to be past tense of Dan, which means judge. Dana is the feminine quality of the judgment faculty in man called intuition. And Dan symbolizes the faculty of judgment in man in its earliest expression before it is lifted to the spiritual plane. Now, this science right here, and all the names, you can go and look in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary by Charles Fillmore. He breaks this shit down of the spiritual meaning of these particular names. <clears throat> you also find that there are Tusi Jews of Burundi. This is um, a picture um, of 1910s. Okay. Right here, those who originated from the strength of the name, the name Mountain of the Moon, all right, Tutsi, right? We find that is a Hebrew name in which that it comes to Tetsi, those who will go forth, all right? So we see that Hebrews are Afro-Blacks. This is the definition of, of, of Blacks being Hebrews in the dictionary. So how can we bypass this? It don't say Europeans. This is what it says. It says Hebrew, a member of the Semitic peoples inhabiting ancient Palestine and claiming descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israelites, a Semitic language of the Afro-Asiatic family. Who are the Afro-Asiatic family? The nation of Islam tells you that you are Af um, Asiatic. The um, nation of God's on earth, formerly called the Father Sinners, tells you that you are Asiatic. It's the language of the ancient Hebrews. Now the national language of Israel, in other words, Hebraic, from Eber. So right here it says Afro, a thick hairstyle which tightly curl or sticks out all around the head like a natural hairstyle of some black people. It says right here, independent usage of Afro or abbreviation of African in the 1930s. <clears throat> The Limba tribe in southern Africa has Jewish roots. Genetic tests reveal. All right? So get the book, Limba, a lost tribe of Israel in southern Africa. <laughs> right here, you can see me. This is from, um, once again, from myancestry.com, mytrueancestry.com. The red star is me. What is the closest group of my heritage, as you see here? The closest is the Limba. The Limba, Lost Tribe of Israel. The Limba, Tribe of Southern Africa, has Jewish roots, genetic tests revealed. Limba and these so called Kohen modal haplotype. So I have the Kohen modal haplotype, because right here, look at the population source. The closest is limba derived. That's the closest, as you see here. Here it is in the MDLP World 22 Oracle results. And this wasn't from um, my true ancestry. This is from GEDmatch, G-E-D-Match, M-A-T-C-H. And it says the exact same thing. Look here to the mixed mode population sharing. It's not no mixed mode. It is primary population source and what is it? One through twenty is limba. God damn. Here it is, limba E dash M two, which is E one B one A and is what? Sixteen. Rimba is eleven. Vinda is thirty two. Fake Jews zero. You see that? Okay, so this sacred prayer language is a mixture of Hebrew and Arabic. No coincidence, I've always been attracted to Hebrew and Arabic. I speak Hebrew and Arabic. Right here, a wide DNA genetic study in 1996 of 49 limbo males suggests that more than 50% of the limbo Y chromosome are Semitic in origin, not Hermetic, and not Jabbikit. 
or Japit. The genetic studies also shows that 50% of the males in the Buba clan have the Cohen marker, a proportion which is higher than that which is found in the general Jewish population because they don't have it. Members of the priestly clan of the Lemba, the Buba clan is one of the 12, of which is one of the 12 clans, have a genetic element also found among the Jewish priestly line known as the Kohenim. So I have that Kohenim, as you see, 1 through 20 is Lemba. My closest, my, my, my closest population is Lemba, as you see which ruled on the throne of ancient Egypt, which is Hebrew Israelite, which is the Moors. Same lineage, y'all. So the debate between these three crazy-ass groups, the Moors against the Hebrew Israelites, the Hebrew Israelites against the Egyptians, and the Egyptians against the Moors, all that shit is bullshit. It's bullshit. This was amazing, Professor Trudeau, Parfit from the University of London told the BBC, it looked as if the Jewish priest line continued in the West by people called Kohen. And in the same way, it was continued by the priestly clan of the Limba people. You see that? So let's go down. In order to be more specifically defined, the Limba people's origin, Parfit and others developed a large study in order to compare additional Limba subjects from whom clans were recorded with males from South Arabia, who are who? The Yemenites and Africa, the Tutsis and etc., who also, the Falashians, who also claim, as well as the Ashkenazim and the Sephardi Jews or Jewish people. Several rabbis and Jewish associations support their recognition that descendants of the Lord's tribes of Israel. They have to, because we have more Kohen genetic markers as proven. So not only am I from the tribe of Judah, Dan, I'm also from the Levi tribe, the priest Levi tribe, proven as you see here. And so when we're talking about right here about the tribes, you see Dr. Ben is from Ephraim and Gad. Right? I'm from Judah, which is also Dan, which I always knew because my last name was Dancy, um, adopted name was Dancy. So I knew it was Dan. It was that connection with that. All right? And then also it's from Levi. Now we showed you who Levi was. They are the priests. All right? So this is the science behind this. This is why you have to do your test. Right here, your closest genetic moderate population is Lumba, 7.788. So, you see various other African tribes that have descent of E1B1A. We see down here. List of African tribes who descended of the Hebrew Israelites nation, Nanakobi. Here they are again. We showed you Tusi. Here it is in Rwanda. Bayaya, Uganda. The Beta Israel, which are the Falashians in Ethiopia, the Limbo of South Africa, um, the Rusafi of Zimbabwe, um, the Sifi um, Weyawaso of Ghana, the Ashanti of Ghana, um, the Iwa Ghana, the Bena of Ephraim, the Yoruba of Nigeria, Lam Lam Timbuktu, and the Kasina, Nigeria, and the South. Ephraim, uh, Ephraim, um, Ephraim um, which is Abraham of the Madagascar and the Eve of Nigeria. You see that the Bimaliki have 100% E1B1A. The Cameroons, which are Bantoi people, have 93.3%. You see Ghana, or the Kawa, which have 92.3%. We have um, um, Nandi, which is the Northeastern Bantu, who have 100%. We see um, the Yoruba at 93.1%. So this is why you have the Yoruba people who still perform to this day animal sacrifice within their religion. But their religion actually is Hebrew, Israelite, 
traditions and teachings. So we find that these 12 clans or 13 Israelite clans coded with the DNA reveals that Israelite is composed of E1B1A only nation. See, Ruben. All right? one b one a one a one e Simeon. All right? You want to be one A, one A, one B, right? Levi. You want to be one A, one A, one G, one. Asher. You want to be one A, right? But you want to be one A, one A. So right there. Manias. You want to be one A, one A, F, on one A. Ephraim. You want to be one A, one A, one F, one A, one. Gershom. All right, well, Judah in this case, he won't be one A, one A, one G. Ishakar, he won't be one A, one A, one G, one E, two. Zebulon, he won't be one A, one A, one G, one D. Dan, he won't be one A, two. All right, Manassas, he won't be one A, one A, one F. Ephraim, he won't be one A, one A, one F, one A, one. Benjamin, he won't be one A one A one F one. So this shows you, all right, these connections. All right, he go my maternal line, which is mitochondrial DNA L one, which is Hebrew Israelite, from the expansion of the Bantu, and they'll tell you that, as well as also paternal lineage Y DNA is he won't be one A one A one C one B. So this shows us. These connections over and over again. All right? So um, I'm going to end this right here. Where, oh, let me show this. The ruling class of the Moors possessed haplogroup E1B1A2. Since we went through the Egyptians, um, Shemites, we went through the Hebrew Israelites, Shemites. All right? We went through now the Moors. So let me show you these last three slides. And it says Moors of what? Cordoba Caliphate. The word Cordoba is... In Spain, the Moors of Spain, the Khalifa, right? The word Khalifat or Khalifa means successor. And what did these rulers have from more the Moors of Cordoba? They had E1B1A, 1A1, or E1B1A. You see? So the Moors have E1B1A. The Hebrew Israelites have E1B1A. The Egyptians had E1B1A. Case closed. So here you have Moorish remains in Spain. What is that? A six-point star configuration showing that the Moors knew that they was Hebrews, Israelites. Now Moors don't know that they're Hebrew Israelites. They're stupid. Here is the first Moorish Zionist temple in which that was formed by Leon Rochelle, and this is Herman um, um, Mordecai, and this is the Moorish Zionist temple of the Moorish Jews in the 1920s. This is in Harlem. Look at it. Okay? So, this is what we do know. All right? And we'll come down. That's supposed to be the last joints. But, um, right here, indigenous Americans. Right here, physical characteristics. Let's read this. I'm going to read the last one. Geneticists have discovered that some of the people in remote um, Amazonia are somewhat different from other indigenous populations. They show evidence that their genome of, a, of descent are from a people most closely related to the people of Papua New Guinea, Australia, and mainland East Asians. This is still much to learn. So the indigenous Americans are those from Papua New Guinea, in Australia and mainland East Asian. So let's look at Papua New Guinea indigenous people, how they look. Oh, there they are. They look like your ass. Oh, okay. We keep going. Who they look like? They look like you. Okay, so let's go to the Australian Aboriginal people, how they look. Okay, here they are. No, oh, here they are. Just like you again. So this is who populated and who are called the what? The indigenous Americans. This is actually from Geno, Genome Link. 
from another DNA site. And they tell you who the people were here. These people closely related to people of Papua New Guinea and Australia and the mainland East Asia. Wow. Okay. And as you see, here I am again, and look at this. Australia. What the hell? What is Australian doing there? When did niggas from Africa get time to travel during a 400 year period to Australia and have sex and then come back to the Americas? Oh, okay. Now you see what's going on? See, this is in DNA. I got Australian in my DNA. What the hell is that doing there? Oh, I tell you why. Because of them. Because of them. They came here. <laughs> East Asian people, how did they look? East Asian people, the people of East Asia, which consists of China, Taiwan, um, ja um, Japan, Mongolia, North Korea, and South Korea. The total population of all countries within this region estimated 1.677 billion and 21% of the world population in 2020. So let's look at the um, Asians and who they come from. Okay, these are the first Asians who are the Kong people who went into not just the Congo, which that's where they get that from. These Congo people, Congolese um, people uh, um, left from out of the interior of Africa or Kong people left out from the interior of Africa and went into Asia and became the first Asiatics, as you see here at the top. This is how the real or the original Chinese and Asian people looked before the mixing so much of the of the Europeans. Same way that Asians today are um, are on the dick of the Albion European is the same as they were thousands of years ago. Okay. So right here, the red, brown, and black men of America and Australia. And they're white supplanters. This is by G.T. Batani. All right. So when we're talking about that, we're looking at these people here. The first Americans, it says right here, who is known as Lucia, as you see. This is where the origin uh, of the name America comes from, an Aboriginal or one of the various copper-colored natives found on the American continent by the descendants of European settlers. The following is the original name of the name of the application of the name Maru. Maru is who? Uh oh, the word go to what's the dictionary in Torsaurus, it says what more? More is Maru or Mu or Mur. Who said it be what? Ancient North African people of mixed Berber and Arab descent who invaded and conquered Spain in the eighth century. Moorish adjectives. That's why we don't use the term Moorish, we want to say just more, but we sometimes use it. And it's right here. Mur and Moor are one and the same. Who are Maru? The original application of the name of Maru is America. Amuraka. Amura. Amaruka. All right. So you don't believe me. We go right here to the name of America and we come down. And it says America not only written as Amaruka or America or America or Maraca or Moraka and America. So America, which is written as America, is written Morocco. Hence, we are the Moroccans. Moroccan. So more is short for Morocco, which is America. This is according to the book Name of America. So it did not come from Americo Vespucci, who was actually, his name was not America. That was a nickname they gave him for the discovery of America. But it came from Amaru, which was a Peruvian name as used amongst the Incas. Amaru, as we know Tupac used the name Maru. Amaru. All right, the shining serpent. So the return of the serpent of wisdom is America, the land of the serpents. Remember, or the Nagas. Right here, you don't believe it? It says the Americans refer to the Hindu Parashna um, leg, um, um, legends as Potala, the kingdom of the Nagas, the serpents. And who are the Nagas? The Anu people, the land of the wise serpents. Jesus said, to be wise, the serpents beget gentle as dogs. Remember? I'm going to the wilderness and lift up the serpent. That's talking about Kundalini energy, serpentine fire, 
as Earth, Wind, and Fire told us already. That is the Central American deity um, of the Mayan Indians, Kukukan, or what is called Quasicoto, the plume serpent, the feather serpent. In Peru, he was called Amaru. All right, and the territory was known as Amapa. You get it? So, who was the Americans? It says a native of America originally applied to the Aboriginals. We are the Aboriginals. Remember, I showed you um, that we came from Australia and who were known as what? Aborigines and copper colored races found here by the Europeans, but now applies to the descendants of Euro Europeans born in America. No, no, no. You get a penny, which is copper colored, and it matches our complexion. In fact, this is my complexion right here. Not someone who is mixed or who is a um, hybridized um, or uh, um, half breeded. Uh, 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 Real low, I showed you um, pictures in my last presentation about an um, individual by the name of, <clears throat> who was the so-called uh, chief of the Choctaw, Gary. <laughs> okay? I showed you about Gary. No. All right, so you go to Kenya, you find out that the Maru people are, Amuru people was also in Kenya. It says right here, the concept of God and the tradition faith of the Maru people in Kenya. The Maru is located at the eastern point of the Mount Kenya. Maru people came from Northland Africa, moved into Kenya. You see, they came from Kenya. And it says Maru, south of Egypt, uh, Maru, Arusha, and Mobasa, finally through the Tantan Atana River to the present land. The Maru or the Amaru or the Amaru, or the Amaru or the Amaru people also claim that they came from all the Bantu speaking communities, Eastern, Southern, and Central. All right, so right here. So right here, so who was the Maru? They all called the Nagas. Same people, y'all, you see? So the Maru people are the Nagas. The Anu people are the Nagas. The Ethiopians are the Nagas. You are the Nagas. Nagas. So poop poop niggas. All the lies are over. All your magically delicious lies are over. Get the book, Heritage Restored. Right here. The word America is how Greeks call Maru, who pronounced it Amarukos, from the South American Indians, Tupac Amaru. And the word America bears no relevance whatsoever to America or Van Spusky. None. Amir is part of that. It means ruler, chief, governor, prince. You see? Maru, right here, chief, director, overseer. So now we know you get the book, Mayor to Moore, came in until now, the etymology, uh, 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 the, um, the phonology, the semantics, and the morphology of the word Moore. It's by Cosmo L. And what he says right here, he said, in, um, um, George G. James referred to the Moors as the custodians of Kemet or Kemetic culture. In the 8th century, the Moors, native of Mauritania in North Africa, invaded Spain and took with them the Egyptian culture, which they had preserved and knowledge in those days was centralized. Moro is Maru. <clears throat> it's in the notes. Keep in mind that vowels A E I O U Y are interchangeable with more, mer, and um, synonyms as well. Emphasis the word Morica. Letter of the O is interchangeable with E, which becomes American, or um, more, or a American. Right? This is from um, W. Berry, Encyclopedia um, Herodicit, or Herodicit. Morican becomes a derivative of more, as I just finished telling you. Thus, American or American, Al Moroccan or consistent. Simple. You go to the teaching of the um, Patajo Tep, the oldest book in the world, you have Mir, the guardian of. That's what that means, guardian of. The guardian of what? Right here. It says the Moors are the custodians or the guardians of the comedic culture. That's what they was the um, bearers of. And this is on the back, this is on the dollar, on the back of the dollar bill. You, that's the reason why you see the pyramid. That's our symbol. And here you see the owl in the upper right-hand corner over the one, which is also our symbol. The owl represents truth, insight, um, power, and wisdom, 
with the ability to see through darkness. It turns its head 360 degrees in all directions. It is also the symbol of the empire, the Tatarian. The Tatarian Empire is the Moorish Empire, the Olmec Empire, the Songhai Empire, the Ghanaian Empire, the um, Malian Empire. All of that is the same empire, the Kushite Empire. Same people. Connected. So, right, the term more has roots in MR, found in an old Marrakesh or Tamarian Moru or Maruka. So, everybody knew this. You didn't know it. The old Moorish language in which it has come to be known as the Egyptian, Hebrew, and American languages, respectively. In other words, the Phoenician. So, it says the Moor is the hidden and true nationality of the real ancient Egyptians. Uh oh, that's why Moors have E1B1A. That's why the real ancient Egyptians, such as Ramses III, had E1B1A. This is reason why the Hebrew Israelites have E1B1A. You get it? And now you also know the reason why you have E1B1A and 650 to 75% of your people are here in the Americas. Right here, back in March 2, 22, um, 2013, my wife and I and 17 other persons went to Cancun via Tulum, um, Olmec and Pyramids in Mexico. This is Jesus, or Jesus, as you see on his name tag over here to the right. Uh, Rufus was um, Baba, um, um, Azariah, or Azazil. And this is what he says, um, Jesus. All right? So since, you know, some people are waiting on white Jesus to come, I went to go get us a Mexican Jesus to tell us the truth of what is going on. So let's listen to it. Hold on, let's get it. Egyptians, Nubians, you know, there's E1B1A, as well as also E1B1B, came over here, because we always dwell as Shemites or Shemites with our Hermetic brothers and sisters. We showed you that the majority of us, 50 to 75% of us, have E1B1A. That means 50, that means 50% to 25%, or 25% to 50% of us must have portions of E1B1A and also R1B. So, let's hear what Jesus also says on this one.
And this is him and us on the bus. everything that we've been talking about as we're saying that we was here in Omex, all right? And this is verified, as we know, through the Royal Sphinx of Egypt and Chichen Itza Mayan Temple in Mexico, not South America. The ancient Egyptian artifacts found in Mexico confirmed as authentic, as you see here. So there's relics in Mexico 
all right, from Egypt. Aztec, Mexico, you have the Aztec archaeological site of uh, Ankh, which comes from Africa, but now it's in the Americas. We have the Arizona Gazette, a newspaper in which they had explored the information as well as also the Arizona Gazette, uh, excuse me, uh, um, of um, Phoenix Gazette of April the 5th, 1909. And it tells about the excavation of the rock cut vault by exposition led by Professor S.A. Jordan of the Smithsonian. But the Smithsonian claims that they absolutely have no knowledge of the discovery and, it's, and, and of the discoveries. They don't know nothing about S.A. Jordan. But that obviously is a lie. The Egyptians came to the Grand Canyon around 1700 BC. As we showed you who that was, that was Ramesses III, our ancestor, for those who have E1B1A. My ancestor, 96.1%. This is a fact, proof of fact, by those who are 18 temples in the, at the Arizona in the Grand Canyon. What was found in the ancient um, in the Grand Canyon, the ancient Egyptians in the Grand Canyon? Well, let's see. This is the cult, one of the cult um, cut vaults in which that is talking about. This is John Wesley um, um, Powell and his um, native friend here, Jacob Vernon um, Hamlin. All right, but they found these shrines here. They said they identified a shrine from Sepi um, Sepinrani. Uh, which spell is um, Seti. Um, king Seti was King Akhenaten's son that began his rule at Saqqara. It only lasted 10 years, but during that time, um, he came to the Americas. So this was the Amana. That means the 18th dynasty period people, the same people of Akhenaten, uh, Uncle Unten, King Tut. Their, uh, their brother, his, well, Akhenaten's son, and Tutankhamun's brother came here to the Americas. This is what they found. They found, um, as you see here, um, mummies, sarcophagus, or sarcophagi, uh, mummies in the sarcophagus. All right? They found these statues. All right? They found, and guess what? The alignment of what they found was in perfect alignment with the Orion zone or the Orion constellation. So when we talk about Beetle Jews or Beetle guys, of Betelgeuse, um, the energy coming back. Well, here is the area in which that shows the exact same Arizona star correlation to Orion. And the reason why um, Arizona is special um, is because the energy is shown there. All right? This is why they use the Grand Canyon. As you see here, they have um, um, these cult cut areas here in which that shows um, these particular um, statues, comedic statues, all right? This is also the cult vote in which that is called a um, uh, Kincaid cave, all right, which we find later on, um, all right? We find out that these Egyptian um, things is there. It says um, items is there of, um, it says, including the name that began with King Zephna, or Zephna, all right, um, coming to Aslan, all right. Now, Aslan is actually Mexico um, via the Atlantic or Atlantis, right. Here we have inside the Grand Canyon, what do you see? A sphinx. These are the gold artifacts from Kincaid Tunnel, a cave on display in the Smithsonian um, Institute at Washington, D.C. from the Grand Canyon. But I thought that they didn't know anything about the Grand Canyon um, discoveries, discoveries and artifacts. But these are the two artifacts from King Akhenaten and Queen Nefertiti. So um, um, King or Pharaoh um, Seti, who was the brother to Tutankhamen, who ruled um, Saqqara, had this information there. Here, in the temples. It's called the Isis Temple or Set Temple. This is actually a pyramid, as you see here. An actual pyramid, a step pyramid in which that came out into directions. Right? So was it created by Native Americans or by ancient Egyptians? Well, 
he already told us who was created by. Ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians was here. We are descendants of the ancient Egyptians, the Nubians. Okay. All right? So right here, the southern Illinois, the general known as Little Egypt, Shuni, or the Shoni um, National Forest in Ozark, Illinois. Look at that. That's a pyramid. In fact, that's the top of a pyramid. All right? Here in Memphis, you had in 1912 discovery of a sphinx. That's why they put um, the pyramid um, there near the Memphis Railroad or from the water in Memphis, um, Tennessee. All right? So we have all of these discoveries. This is Burrow Cave, Illinois. We have these Egyptian, ancient Egyptian artifacts that was found there. Writings. Um, Metro Nature, Egypt, and the correlation between South America, Peru, and Egypt. All of this shows you. We see right here the Peru uh, um, crossing their arms and the Egyptian crossed arms. We see the mummification in both cultures. We see um, the snakes in Peru, known as the Nagas, throughout Egypt and Peru. Uh, we see the elongation of the head, so the skulls in Peru and Egypt. We see the serpent at the top. Um, of the um, tiaras or crowns in ancient Egypt. You see right here, the ancient cities of the New World by Desiree Charnay. So America was full of large cities and incredible structures, yet everyone thinks that we are just primitives running around lost. All right? So come to find out that these are your answers. According, we are not just Africans, the black native Americans by Clyde Winters, all right? Look at these pictures. Full-blooded Choctaw, full-blooded Cherokee, full-blooded Seminole, Shoshone. These are the descendants of the Omex. You and I are descended from them. So not only are we Egyptians, not only are we Moors, not only are we Hebrew Israelites, you are also Native Americans or American Natives. And then once and for all, the dissension between all these fake ass Negroes who don't do any research and study. It's over for them. This presentation right here kills all the noise. It's time for us to once again come back into knowledge of self. All right. So right here, return of the ancient ones. Not all these. Not all these people were black aborigines. Washington Nation, including the Washer, the Choctaw, and several more tribes. These people were small and were the Choctaws. The Choctaws and Turnica were all black. American Indian, you can see here more at 465 code. Here, you see the Federal Race Classification Code, you see 667. You see the Massachusetts Bay Corp, you see 1237 7, more. So considerable portions of the blood of the Southern um, Negroes of the United States is unquestionably Indian. This is from the Smithsonian Institute, Bureau of America. All right, so I end here. All right, case closed. All right, we're going to see um, everybody out. We're saying peace to everyone. All right, be out, y'all. Peace. Peace. Thanks for that, Doug. Peace, peace, peace. Peace, great one. Thank you. Peace. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace.